place for us. Sorry to sound official, but I'm calling the Concord School Committee meeting to order. I will note that we are being recorded by CCTV in the back. Um, don't worry, none of you are being zoomed in on. And, and I'm calling the uh, Concord Carlisle Regional, Regional School Committee to order. And no, we are being recorded. <laughs> um, come on in, we still have, I'm sure we'll have people wandering in as we go. Um, before we jump in, I just want, Dan and I both want to say first welcome and thank you, we all do. Um, I'm Heather Bowd, I'm chair of the Concord Public School Committee. Dan is chair of the Regional High School School Committee. Um, and we want to thank, first of all, thank you to the New Mission High School for hosting us here. It's wonderful, Naya, wherever she is, um, to, to put us up here. And thank you all for coming out and joining us. Um, this is something that several of us have wanted to do for a while, to bring a school committee meeting into Boston, um, just to provide more accessibility for all of our Boston parents. So we hope that it's of value and, and somewhat interesting to everybody. Um, it, normally, our school committee meetings are purely a business meeting, but because we don't get to interact with you folks this that much, Tonight, we're also going to do just kind of a town hall style Q&A question and answer session um, so you can bring up any questions or comments that you might have that may be relevant to the school committee. So um, we'll get to that at the very beginning. Um, to, after this is all done, we would love your feedback, and I think Aaron will reach out to all of you on whether or not this is helpful and useful, and if so, we'll do it again. And if not, and you feel like it was an obligation, then we, we won't bug you with it again. Uh, but we just want to be here if it's if it's of any use. And um, what else? Uh, that's pretty much it. Oh, other than we will do the, the kind of Boston-oriented things first. After that, if people need to go, we will completely understand. We know everybody has families at home, and it is not easy to stick around. Um, so if people start to wander out, no problem at all. If you want to stay for the whole thing till the bitter end with us, we love that too, certainly. We'll be here just kind of conducting business even after we're all done talking. Um, that's about it. Any other? Oh, no, I just want to welcome everyone um, as well. And on a personal note, um, I went to a high school that was partnered with the Medco program. I went to Lexington High School, so I know firsthand um, the value of having a school system that partners with Medco. And I think it's especially um, timely that we're here on the 50th anniversary of Medco as well. Yes. So I want to personally welcome you and um, just express my personal um, value uh, that I have for the Medco program. Great. And I also promised someone I would mention, none of us have microphones or anything and we are all supposed to use our projective outdoor voices because this is being recorded by CCTV and it can be hard to hear if we don't project. Um, so with that, We'll kick it right off. We're starting with recognitions um, and a group called, do you want to introduce yeah. Actually, Aaron, I'm gonna, Aaron's Aaron Aaron to come up and get us started. Sure, where's the best place? Here is okay or? Yeah, that's yeah. great. Um, it's usually a little different setup than Concord, so I <laughs> yeah. know where I'm supposed to stand and deliver. Um, so I just wanted to start by uh, thanking all of our parents uh, for coming tonight. Um, Really appreciate the show of support for the program and uh, your participation this evening. Um, and so that's my first uh, gratitude. My second would be to the committees um, for coming up with the idea. Um, I think it's a nice opportunity also to get some uh, time with Dr. Hunter to meet her as she gets started uh, in her tenure in Concord. Um, we've had some, some really positive interactions already. I know that she's a strong supporter of the program and really eager to get to know you and, and uh, get to know what works best for our students and families. Um, so really appreciative of the school committee's efforts to be here tonight and, and hold the meeting. I'm just going to offer a very, very brief, uh, some highlights uh, about our program. And then we've got a couple of uh, high school st students who are seniors who are going to join me up front and just talk a little bit about their experiences. Um, they've been here since elementary school, so they've had a, a good uh, Fund and knowledge to tap into. Um, uh, this year we have uh, 79 students in grades K through 8. There's 44 students at Alcott and 35 at the middle school. Um, and then at the high school we have 52 students. Um, so we're averaging uh, right about 10 to 11 students uh, at each grade level. 
Uh, I think that, you know, we were talking a little bit informally uh, beforehand. I think over the past maybe 10 years or so, during my tenure, there are a lot more uh, schools in Boston that are seen as options for economy, so I think there's more competition than there used to be. Uh, but when I go out and speak to directors in other communities, um, Concord's reputation is still uh, very strong and it's still a very desirable community for families uh, to have their students attend. So I think a lot of that is due in part to uh, parent participation and uh, your involvement with your own children and their contributions. And I think that um, certainly our teachers and staff have a great deal to do with that too because I think they're very committed to the program. Um, you know, at the elementary school, I think it, one of the demonstrations of the commitment to the program is that we have a very robust family friends program. So each of our students that wants to be connected to a family in Concord uh, has a cooperating family that are sometimes two or three for each of our, our Boston students, um, simply because there may be more families that want to participate than we have students that we, we share. Um, at the middle school, we've done a lot of work in the last couple of years at uh, really encouraging our students to find ways to connect outside of the classroom. So um, last year, 100% of our students at the middle school participated in some activity uh, other than or outside of the classroom, whether that's uh, chef's club or an intramural sport or interscholastic sport, um, homework club, there's a, a variety of opportunities that the middle school provides. And then this year at the high school, uh, over 50% of our freshmen enter the high school this year uh, enrolled in at least one honors class. So that's been a real point of emphasis for us over the years too is to increase the number of students enrolled in honors and upper level courses. So I think we're really making some progress there. And again, a lot of that is a testament to the good work that goes along with the partnerships between home and school. Um, so I'm gonna introduce uh, Raven Heath and ask her to come up and CJ Israel is in the back. Come on up, CJ. So they're just gonna give you a little bit of information about uh, their experience and how they came to Concord and what it's been like for them. Um, so hi, I'm Raven, I'm a senior at CC and I've been going to Concord College School since So 
same thing like how do people respect the world a lot of the things not really have as uh as long as the program so I can respect it if you can you know certain topics and uh just to let you know you know it's probably never met by the other people. About uh some of the Um, I would say one of the biggest challenges for me is like transportation. Um, waking up really early in the morning and being on an hour bus drive to Concord and then getting to school and having like a six hour day of school and then getting on an hour bus drive back to Boston and then having like piles of homework. It was just, it was really overwhelming, but like you honestly, you get used to it as you go on. Obviously I've been in since kindergarten, so I probably got used to it by like second, third grade. But still, as you get older, it gets more tough if you want to do like after school sports or like Club after school, and you have to wait till like six o'clock to get on the bus, and then you get home crazy late, and you still have like a lot of homework. So I'll say that's probably the biggest challenge. Kind of the same thing with, for me. Yeah. I would always do my homework on the bus. Once I got once I got to high school, I kind of I kind of stopped that, but I kind of figured out how to get into it without doing that. But it seems like so this is been this is kind of you got to get used to it and work your way around it. Time. Or this will be the last question. For the parents who are here with younger children in the program, would you give them what advice would you want them to give to their kids? What do you think would be the most helpful? I would say um, always be open minded about what your kid is interested in. Like, they'll probably say like, the craziest stuff that they want to do and just be like, okay, what in the world was that? But I would say just be open minded and just fully support them in what they want to do. And even though some days it may be really hard for them, like, Adjusting to the school, I would say to stay behind their back and just make sure you know that you're taking care of the child. It's definitely important to be in their bedroom when they get to the school. Another thing I like, Carl was mentioning, like, if they mention rivers, make sure they get into rivers. Like, I'm, I'm just not thinking about it. Rivers is like so good, and the fact that it's the curriculum that is really there for the middle school is like, we actually we take all the students, like, like, on college students, we all go to the Boston one day. And have that experience so that the college students can know what it's like, it's like that can be every day and it's kind of on the bus and they get, you know, rising and not used to it, but it's really just a normal one where they get all of us and they can get to see what it's like to be in that long community. Rivers and Revolutions is a program at the high school. It's for uh, juniors and seniors. It's a semester long interdisciplinary program. Both Ray and CJ are a little bit in this first semester. Um, it's a cohort model, so there's up to 50 students that will be enrolled at any given time. And um, I think that one of the real points of emphasis for the program has been on giving uh, Mark and Carla students an opportunity to have some experiences in the city and take advantage of um, some of the resources that are here, but also at sort of a, a real world level for, for students and for here in the program. It's about um, giving them some exposure to the daily. Uh, sort of grind, I guess, for lack of a better word, right? Of you know, uh, commuting in and out, um, giving some sort of what neighborhoods are like, so that, you know, it's uh, a lot of students will go into the popular spots in Boston, but not necessarily be where families are living in the neighborhood. So that's the neat point that these guys have been able to share with, uh, with that group. And this year's first cohort, I think, is for 13.
doing their homework. So um, I would say being a mentor is probably the biggest challenges, but one of the biggest benefits of having being a mentor. Too. <laughs> so we're not only aware of both like power mentor, but also mentor for advising. It's something that all freshmen get every single Monday. Talk to them. So, like, on most fronts, like, it's really cool out there with some people that are like, they know and that they always have fun to talk to or talk to them all. Like, they, you know, I don't know how to do that. They walk by and say hi, like, a lot. So, a lot of the freshmen that I had on the advisory and on the, like, our mentor, he was, um, he was a professional advisor. And he was, um, not only my mentor, but also my advisor. So, it was really cool having him there. If there were one thing that you could do to improve your experience, um, having gone through this process, and the folks that have been through behind you, what would it be? Um, I would say um, I know that we do like Mikko families from like kindergarten through high school, so I would say like more acknowledging and more like figuring out like who the Mikko student is more like, um, you know, like, compatible, yeah, compatible yeah. with because. Like, I have Michael families that I'm still friends with to this day, but I have Michael friends who just, like, I don't talk to my Michael family anymore. I haven't talked to them since, like, third grade. So I would say, like, don't put a push on it. Don't put people who, like, talk to these kids. But I would say, like, especially in high school, because I know we tried to make it in high school, a lot of my friends didn't even get a family at all. So I would say just being able to push the Michael kids to talk more out of their, out of their range and being able to talk to other kids in the country. That's really good what she was saying because you know for us we have families that we want to welcome to us and other students that are very they we don't have that and for whatever it's, you know no one's fault but it is such because you know we have friends that we can do zones we have friends that we can call all the time but have this this one we do the same thing with the school or other friends they don't they don't have um anything or just not at all as much
an immense amount of respect for you guys and for the students who do this every day. Like you, I mean, the obvious challenge that you talked about was the transportation, and I know that there's so much more behind that, too. It's, it's obviously a big challenge to come into a town where everybody looks different from you, and, and you can feel like an outsider at first. And I just have so much respect for you and for all of the parents for helping their children do this. And it, I would like to say it brings a lot of value to Concord and to our students and kids, too. Um, and I just, I, I just think it's so wonderful. So thank you all for all that you're doing, and 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 kudos to you for for <laughs> growing up to be <laughs> getting through 12 years <laughs> or 13 <laughs> um, so successfully. Well done. committee meetings. Um, we usually clarify that it's a, a meeting that happens to be held in public um, and it, it's not all interaction so that we can stick to business topics. But again, um, and especially for those of you who might have come in a little later, we don't have an opportunity to interact with this group of families very much. So we wanted to just kind of open it up um, town hall style to questions, comments, anything. Um, again, we have the, and just to explain, we have the school committees here from the, the Concord School Committee, which is five of us, and then six of us are also a part of the Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee. So it could be questions regarding any level. Um, Lori Hunter is our, Dr. Lori Hunter is our superintendent. John Flaherty is our deputy superintendent in charge of operations and, and finance. Um, and they're all of us. So anything, we just want to kind of open it up to questions or comments that we might be able to help with. Yes, can you speak to that one? I can speak to it probably not with as much detail as I will be able to in a few months, but um, we've been watching carefully the performance of your kids at Alcott, and what we've been able to do is really streamline services so that um, by providing them in a one building, we're able to enforce more support. And I have to say, Sharon Young has the most incredible support and academic program I have seen. And I did, I was an elementary principal for 14 years. She mixes and matches kids based on the skill needs that they have. And they're in small groups for math and reading. And after eight weeks, they shift groups based on how their needs have changed. Um, I mean, it's really state of the art in terms of what opportunities she's providing all kids in that school because it's absolutely focused in on what their math and reading skills are. So we've seen great growth. Uh, Alcott was a commendation school at, on the MCAS last year. We're, see, we're watching data all the time and really responding to it. So please interact with the teachers and get more details on what's really going on for your individual children. But we do believe and feel it's successful right now. Good question. First, I just want to say thank you for allowing students to a, be a part of a school like Concord, uh, Carlisle. I know this past summer you guys were just ranked, at least from uh, Boston Magazine, you guys were ranked second in the, in the region for schools. And I find that to be very helpful. My sister goes to uh, Sanborn right now. I was lucky enough to go to uh, some pretty 
rigorous uh, private schools growing up, so I, I see how valuable education is in the school that you go to specifically and the resources that it has. Um, so I guess my question is, it's okay, you know, going to different high schools is one thing, but what are the resources that are in the Concord Carlisle district when it comes to college? The reason why I ask that is anyone can go to school, right? But how, do you, how are you going to apply to college? Is there someone that's going to be guiding you? Um, to get there, because I know, at least in our family, we're first generation. My parents don't really know the whole process. I've gotten experience to it because I've gone through it. But you know, what what's there to, to help families who may not have that exposure to the whole college application process? And, and you know, is there a college counseling uh, committee or anything like that? Aaron works very closely with the guidance department, so you're probably best to answer that. Um, what we do at the high school is um, we. Uh, by, by year of graduation, cohort our students with one guidance counselor. So that way, um, the, the guidance counselors, starting in the sophomore year, at the end of sophomore year, they start to do a little bit of, um, similar to like the Briggs Myers personality testing, to so figure out kind of where their academic interests might lie, what career tracks might be of interest for, things of that nature. And then in uh, the junior year, uh, students take the PSAT, um, and uh, they meet more frequently with the guidance counselors. And the guidance runs uh, something called college groups, lunch groups, uh, during lunch blocks. And they're open to all students. But we really try to encourage our students to attend them regularly. Um, they're going to work there with a program called Naviance, which is online. And all of our students at the high school have access to it. Um, so as they get a little bit older, as they begin the process, they'll start to narrow down the type of institution, um, what matches well with their academic. Uh, expectations, what the you know, fields of study they might have, whether it's urban schools, urban schools, and all those types of things. Um, and they really will, will handle the through the process. Uh, many of the students at the high school, as you can imagine, have a lot of mental involvement. And then we have students who parents are not in school, you know, so they're going to be first generation students. And the guidance counselors are going to engage that and work really closely with them. Um, and then during junior, especially senior year, uh, you know, we work uh, closely with the CC Scholarship Fund, for example, so they come in and meet with our students individually to talk about the application process, make sure that all of our kids apply for that uh, pool of funding. There's, there's a lot available there that kids can have access to. So we, we try to do individual things like that to make sure that kids are available. There, I was going to add, there's also opportunity for parents to come into the school. They run great workshops at night both on the college process starting around junior year as well as financial aid process. Um, different, they also have different subjects each night, but um, I was a college advisor many years ago, but the stuff, the, the documents that they produce and the way they um, put together those workshops and those evenings for parents, even if you can't go, you can get access to it on the website and it's really, it's very thorough, it's really informative. So it's good, that's a good place to go and you know, sort of watch to see where, you know, are you on the right timeline and what you should be thinking about. So there's also those resources out there. We, we've traditionally been able to offer a free SAT prep course too for students junior year in the spring. Uh, there's an outfit called Advantage Testing and uh, the manager of Boston is a CC grad and he has one of his teachers come back. It's a free service that we offer so kids want to take advantage of that. Other questions or comments? Yes.
phenomenal. Other questions? Oh, well, I know, really. <laughs> well, in case it gets discussion going, I actually have a question and I throw it out, similar to what Wally asked of the students. I'd love to throw out to the parents, um, even in addition to or other than what we've already talked about. Is there something that you feel that we as the district or the schools could do to support you better in any way? Yeah. Yeah. I think now that my daughters are in high school and with what's going on politically, um, they're starting to feel that pressure. That pressure of um, a Boston kid, you know, on a minority kid. My kids are biracial, so we really don't talk about minority in our home because we're just family. Mm -hmm. um, but then when they go to Concord, they're minority because they don't belong there, they're not part of there, you know what I mean? And because they're part of Boston, they instantly think that every Boston kid has to be black. Right. We're all part of everything. Yeah. Um, so I think the education on the concrete side needs to be a little bit more open um, mm -hmm. as they get into high school, yeah. as to be a little bit more um, inclusive. Um, because we don't want to send our kids out there feeling isolated. Absolutely. We feel like every day that they go into school, they're against the world. Because we know at home that we're against the world. Right. Mm -hmm. We're working two, three, four jobs to try to get them a home, a roof, an extra curriculum. You know, and then they're taking an hour to get back out to Boston to study. they got to study five. Because I tell my work every day, your job is to be I want you to do a second job or do a side job or a job because I want you to take a summer course so that you can leave that, have that two year already associated with you by the time you get into high school and get into college. Because we know that our kids have to work twice as hard to get ahead of where we are. Um, so it really is nice that the kids in high school, especially when they get to high school, because it's a lot of No different from the other kids in Concord. I'm glad you brought that up because it's something we have been talking about as a district and as a, as a both committees a lot. And um, it's interesting that you say you feel it even more in high school. I believe that it starts at the beginning. It has to be everywhere because these kids and all of the Concord kids need to understand these lessons of inclusiveness from the beginning, so that over the years and by high school, it's just naturally a part of the way they think and the way they act. Um, but one of the things that we're working on this year, one of Dr. Hunter's goals and one of our school committee goals, is to, to initiate and, and to look at cultural proficiency, is what we're calling it, in both districts um, throughout every school. So we actually started as a school committee last week. We figured if we're going to talk the talk, we need to walk the walk. And we did a full day seminar on cultural proficiency, kind of a training. Um, and that was to really better understand for ourselves, what it means to be inclusive and culturally proficient, and also what it would mean to be that in as a district. Um, so I don't, we don't have the, all the answers right now, um, but I'm glad you mentioned it because it is something that we're all thinking about and something that we're very focused on this year. Um, and I would even say, as we take time this year looking at inclusivity and trying to ensure that every child feels a part of the community. And if you have specific thoughts on that, we would love to hear them. We're all about you know, <laughs> taking that feedback, feedback and input. Um, so if you have specific thoughts on how to encourage that, feel free to share those with us. And one thing I'll add, and I, I know lots of hands yeah. up. Oh, good. We got a discussion um, going now. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're not under some delusion that we're going to be culturally proficient in a year. Right. <laughs> and I, I said at our training on Thursday, which the trainers, the two trainers from EDCO, um, said to us that, you know, we, we call it cultural proficiency, but it's also anti-bias, anti-racist training. 
um, that I, I said to this group, I said, I hope this initiative far outlives my time on school committee. That this is a, a long-term initiative of the districts to have a comprehensive cultural proficiency um, awareness and literacy. Um, and I, I, to me, it's, it's very close to my personal principles, and I think it's very important for a district to be culturally proficient. So there are a bunch of comments in back. Okay, starting there, in yellow, I guess. <laughs> it's hard to hear you. Can you speak a little louder? I was ready to all my stuff Okay. about the Metco kids at Alcott versus at all the elementary schools because there is a very valid and real debate over um, cohorting more to give more support versus integrating more. And that's about all I can say, so I'm going to punch it over to Aaron now because he can talk better about that question. <laughs> so, uh, the trial district was designed by the school to welcome Metco communities. So, that's why that particular trip was, was just on Boston. But we always try our best to provide balanced opportunities for our students. So if we want to have many, and I think that there are lots of opportunities for kids to do integrated activities uh, in classes, in their day-to-day -day experiences at school. And we also feel like there are times when we want to recognize and give them opportunities to improve by identity and have the chance to be in a common shared space where the kids can talk about maybe things that are particularly to their experience, um, you know, being students of color in a family white school, or coming from Boston and making a view, or whatever they have that's shared with each other. Now, when we created the mentor program, it wasn't designed to make sure that, you know, that, that it was a one-size-fits-all or anything like that. The, the goal was really to give um, our students just a, an opportunity to be together at times so that there's a balance, right? When we, when we didn't have opportunities for our kids to be together, our student feedback was, hey, we need a space, a physical space, we need time to be together and talk about things that we all have in common, right? And, you know, so, so what we're always trying to do is strike the balance. And we are constantly checking in with the students and making sure that what we're providing is healthy for them, we want to make sure that they're having the chance to take advantage of all of the schools have to offer. Uh, but at the same time, we want to make sure that if there is times when, there are times when we need uh, to have those opportunities that exist and destruction for them.
Yeah, definitely. That's a Several of us started writing as you're saying that. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. And I like that you point out it's, it's not just Metco cultures versus Concord. There are lots. The, the Concord population is continuing to change. I know it's still pretty homogeneous, but there, there are a lot more influences coming in, and there are, 
you know, lots of families who could bring in stories and foods and traditions from various countries. Yeah, exactly. That everybody's bringing something cultural, not just Metco kids or Hong Kong. Yeah, I think it's great for you to hear a little bit of the changes. They're, they're minor in the big picture, but Alcott right now has 30, almost 30 different languages in the children's background at home. So we're increasing English services and things. So there's a lot of great cultural conversations to have and you know, proficiency discussions to have to make sure we're all really on, you know, valuing each other, regardless of what our differences are. Yeah. Yes? That's a very good point. Thank you. Just to pick back off of what she said, I thought yeah. it was a great point as well. But it's also the same point that you guys made. It has to start at a young age. Right. Because right? yes. it's deeply rooted. It and is. Some of these biases are unconscious bias, or subconscious biases, right, that we have. Right. Um, it's not, not necessarily it's been taught. Um, but it can be, a kid can just pick that up from right. someone or something that he sees on some social uh, some form of social media or on the internet, right? It, this is also another challenge for educators. Right. Um, it's the fact that online they see all of this material and you never know what's real and what's not. Right. Um, and if it can trigger someone to, you know, to, to, if it can trigger someone's emotion negatively, that can have an impact at school. Um, but I definitely think, you know, if, if the whole awareness can happen at a younger age, hopefully the goal should be to, you know, have them grow with it and so that by the time they're in high school, it's, Normal, just it's automatic, right? Friends, who cares? It should be almost colorful, right? And, you know, like no one should care about where you're from or where am I from. It's just this. We're both students, like we're both students. Let's enjoy this. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. 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 Ye
Um, so I think that's been a really big positive. The elementary schools are doing some of the, the history in Concord and really understanding the background of Concord. It's not as perfect as we all might think it is based on the uh, texts that are out there in the other corners of the world. I think the Rivers experience, I, I know that was brought to our attention pretty quickly when it happened because they're so gifted there. And again, that program is, is a clinical environment where we can so meet children's needs. And really, um, it's, it's becoming the model of what we need to try to do in the rest of the school culture. Because um, the minute that, that group of teachers saw the profile that was coming to them, they immediately created a curriculum that the kids could relate to and connect with, including the, the history here in Boston. And that trip where they put all 50 kids on the bus and brought them into this neighborhoods here was powerful on both sides. That had immediate impact at the school um, as well as in the broader environment. So I think you're right on track. We're a work in progress. but. I think we're, we're in the right direction, and it's great to hear you confirm some of that. So, yeah, stay, talk to your kids as they start experiencing some different things, and by all means, we need your feedback. Yeah. Let's see. I think there were other hands. A few people were vying for comment space there for a little while. Yes. Go for it. Uh, but one of the, one of the, uh, the issues that I've seen, at least in the early years of college, is that certain kids don't even know what they want to study, right? They're still super young. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't, they, the fact that they don't even know what they want to study, they haven't even thought about what they want to do for a job, right? I think the end goal of all education is either to get a job or to be happy, right? But I think there has to be some sort of link between the two. Right. What are the Concord, uh, what's the Concord Regional Division doing to at least implement financial literacy or some of these STEM, uh, STEM programs that are out there? At a, in the late, in the late years of high school, that will at least keep the students engaged on, hey, when you enter your freshman year, you're going to have to start thinking about what an internship is. Right? Because What's down the line? If you go to college and you get a degree, yeah, that's fantastic, but what is your college degree for? Right? Is that going to be your job? Right. So that's sort of the, that's one of the things that I, at least, because I, I studied psychology in high school, I mean, in, in, in college. Um, and one of the things that we always thought about is that there are a lot of kids that are getting to college and they have no idea what an internship is, right? Some do, those that may have the resources, but some don't, right? So what is, uh, and, and this is, doesn't have to be a yes or answer, but one of the things I was thinking about is so implementing financial literacy at a, you know, at a later stage of high school or, you know, have this focus on the STEM career. Yeah, so there are several things. Yeah, I mean, you STEM to... has been one of our focus areas the last few years, so we've really expanded those offerings elementary right on through the high school, so there's a lot of different electives there. I would say the high school tries to have this really broad bandwidth of diverse opportunities for kids. So I think especially as they get to be upperclassmen, really dive into that program of study, um, because the intention is that they get to try different things and start to figure out what their passions are. Um, there's no one perfect answer, and sometimes you hit it, sometimes you don't, but that is the intent. So definitely you want to dive in as a family. We've got some unique programs, including an internship program with Babson. So, but the menu is so big, I couldn't possibly rattle it all off tonight. The, the document's online, and make sure if you can't find it, you get some help. So I think really that was worth though. pointing out, though. This in, there's an internship program that we've launched with Babson College that a lot of seniors took advantage of last year. Sorry, last year, right? Um, and provides an opportunity for seniors to go out while they're in high school and work as an intern, literally have an internship um, and test out a career option. And there is a financial literacy initiative for us being offered, I believe, what's called a Uh-huh. It's a full, it's a special one, a special one, a lot students can also learn an engineer's
like you have to go to a private school that had all the resources and we right. could quite do everything. You know, basically, they, they legitimately walk you through every step. Right. Right. A lot of public schools do not have that because they don't have right. any resources. Yeah. Right? They may not have a college counselor that can spend 10 hours a week to, to walk you through the entire process from the FAFSA application all the way through yeah. you know, what you need to do when you get to college. If, if a loan pops up that you may not pay. Right? But I think one of the, at least my college counselor did a great job at telling us up front and all the entire step, sort of just laying it all out and also laying out the challenges that come with Right? It's, you can have a great student, but if you're not aware that, hey, if you apply to this school and you get into this, you may not get this financial aid, right? Is your family going to be able to pay this amount, right? Like, the, that kind of conversation, I guess I'm thinking more financially and being more uh, financially aware of the challenges that some of these college students, uh, college colleges may have. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you know, all college counselors are great. They're, they're, they're going to the time to so make sure a student can at least apply to college, right? Certain schools don't have that. And the Boston public school system sees, I think that's one of their biggest challenges, they don't have the resources to coach a bunch of students who don't even care about where they go because they're just not aware of what's out there. They may not, they may not be aware of their potential. Right? A lot of these kids just don't, don't, they may not have the backbone at home, so they may not be like, okay, yeah, maybe I can get into a Harvard or a Yale, right? Because they, that's something that has never even come up in their house. So I think it's just sort of coaching and uh, just making them aware at, at a younger age, which is why I asked, you know, what programs are there, and I think the PSAT, taking the PSAT's junior year, I think that's great. Any other questions out there before we? Wrap it up. Okay. Um, I think it's good for this section then. Um, like I said, I think what we'll do is. Whoops. Sorry. Take a, take a quick break. Yeah, sure. All right. We'll take a quick three minute breather. Um, after that, we have various things on our agenda. We're going to be looking at budgets and school committee goals and all kinds of stuff. And anybody who wants to stay is welcome to stay. We'd love to have you, but feel free to take off and, and get home if you want to. So we'll take a three minute break and then we'll come back to the rest Thank of our agenda. Thank you for coming out. Thank you all so much for being here. We're so happy that we're able to share this with you.
so uh, okay, we right. have no reading of minutes. Right. And chair. we have a chair and liaison before it. Okay. Go, Bob. Bob. Okay, I'll go, for it. go for it. So the uh, policy subcommittee uh, this Friday will meet to discuss uh, policy GDL, which is the vacation time payouts to school administrators. So we have as we were instructed, the letter we received, we're going to pick this up this Friday. Great, that's terrific. And the uh, campus committee met for the very first time, uh, and uh, all 16 were in attendance. Uh, we uh, voted in Mary Stores as chair, John Boynton as vice chair on an 8 to 5 vote with three abstentions, and secretary was voted in as Mary McKay. So we identified several important next steps. Uh, the working group to draft a uh, process and a timeline will meet this Thursday, a couple of days from now. And the next meeting for the full committee is going to be Tuesday, November 7, 5 p.m. at the high school. Great. Other chair okay. and liaison reports? Yeah, other other liaison. Yeah, just a quick update on the uh, calendar working group, which is Wally, Mary, myself, and Lori have met three times. Um, and want to let you know that we um, anticipate uh, putting together a uh, report for this committee on the work that we're doing. And um, that includes uh, four sort of focus areas. And I think most of us have we've covered these a little bit, but these were the sort of felt like the charge out of our full meeting. One was looking at accommodations for kids um, when they miss school for religious or cultural reasons and um, how well are we accommodating them, what policies look like, do they address um, well enough these situations. So we'll, um, we've got, we've lock, uh, looked at other districts and we've got, I know Lori, I don't even want to speak more to this, but has worked with administrators and, and now into teachers with looking at policy and how we might um, put one together to, to have our committee, well first the subcommittee look at and then bring to us as a, a new policy for accommodations. Great. So the administrators and I met for the second time about to look at the policy this morning um, since, you know, it circled back after we brought it to new folks and Peter has looked at it. Um, the plan now is to bring it to the C CTA and CCTA leadership and have them. Have and that's an accommoda the accommodation policy that you're bringing yes. to these groups. Okay. Yes. That's great. So we'll get feedback from them and then it will be actually on that same policy subcommittee agenda on Friday. And I don't know how much you want to share, but is the, okay. is the policy a kind of scripted, here's what you should do and not do, or is it a recommendation? Would, it's a broad umbrella under which to provide accommodations. I think okay. we'll leave it at that so it's made its way through a little bit okay. further to see where it actually lands. Um, the mindset was not to be super prescriptive. We did look at policies in a couple of districts that were four and five pages long. Wow. Really, really specific. Um, we took a broader approach, as did some other districts. We modeled ours after Bedford, which we were drawn to. Um, it's a broader umbrella of accommodations and more of a mindset to accommodations. When Karen yeah. Thomas Thompson was with us um, during that ad administrative meeting, she made it very clear that no matter what we put on paper is only as valuable as the implementation. So it really is about uh, working with staff and talking through their thoughts and concerns and how our execution plays out. Right. So in that in that one element of the stuff that we've looked at, the the, um, the goal would be to go through all these various uh, or, or, uh, groups to get feedback and come up with a proposal to the subcommittee that then will come to us as a policy, ideally to, um, I think, better address accommodating kids who aren't school um, than we have been doing and, the, and the, you know, we, have, we haven't really articulated particularly um, well or updated. Is that really a fair way yeah, I think the policy would be a nice foundation piece. The, again, the rest is dialogue about how we roll that out. So much of what we talked about was a lot of what we've been talking about tonight, you know, sort of that that nuance of awareness, and I like that word a lot, yeah, awareness that we create a safe environment for families to let us know what their practice is so that we can, can accommodate. So lots of great discussion to come, I think. That's great. The plan is to bring it to the 14th. 
to bring it to the to us. To you as a school committee on the 14th of November as a first reading. Okay. Um, and then the other sort of three arms are the legal reading, which we've touched on, and try and um, summarize that succinctly in the report. Um, absentee data, just taking it and really summarizing in a one pager, um, kind of here are the top reading, you know, the 12 highest absence days. Just the stuff that really a lot of it's already been done, but putting it in a way that's, uh, you know, succinct and a good summary for us to really absorb. Um, and then the final piece is community input. We've got um, tentatively scheduled a date for the November 15th, which um, sounds like Peter can come out and we check with Karen. She can come to um, So Karen from ideas from the cultural proficiency training of the administrators. Um, Peter, our legal counsel, can be there. Um, and we are working on and we're finalizing sort of how to structure and message that forum and what it really is about for community to um, participate and offer feedback on. Do we have a, I'm sorry, I may have missed this. Do we have a date for the forum? So tentatively it's November 15th. I mean, just I that's firm. I guess they they okay. All right. And you can come? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good. So, both, both being Karen and Karen Peter. Karen Thompson and Peter yes. Ed. And Karen emailed me today. She's got uh, ideas as, I don't know if I want to use structure in how they approach these kinds of conversations, but she's got a format that she believes will be successful and has been successful in challenging conversations. And will she facilitate that for us? So we're envisioning probably some sort of panel, but Karen and I are going to sync up better on that. Okay. And what time? Seven? Seven. At the high school? I think at the high school. The, the learning comments feels like the right time. Okay. Good time. So and go ahead. Clarify, um, we, I think I'm holding Yes, we still need to have joint work at the beginning of the meeting. Okay, and just on the agenda it says conference. I don't know. Something. Yeah, we, it is. It needs to be joined at the beginning. Okay, yeah. I just can't reply. So that will be a busy week for us because the 14th will be a meeting, the 15th is this forum, and the 16th is a finance committee that we and we don't quite know our exact schedule of the finance committee yet, but we might. We might need to hold that date as well. That's all in my overview of the FY19. Got it. <laughs> separate conversation. Yeah, but just in terms of the dates Good that week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also to be sure that the community input aspect is um, we all well understand what we're after as well as communicating well to the community what the, what the purpose and hope is for getting feedback. Um, so, those are sort of the four areas we've done a little more work. We're going to fine tune this stuff about the forum. Um, the timeline looks like we're still on, like, which, which it will be part of what we'll produce or, or offer with this um, report. That November 14th is this new accommodations policy. We'll be able to look at that and talk about that. The following meeting, ideally, we'll have tweaked and, and can vote the new policy if we agree to, to do that. And that will be also the first time we see an academic calendar that's presented to us from the district calendar committee. Um, so we can talk about that. And then the following, which is the December 12th meeting, is our opportunity to vote for the vote the academic calendar for 2018 wow. What a process. Thank you guys for running this. This is a... So I just have a question. Uh, sure. do you, have you picked a date yet when you're going to make the announcement about the formal? Um, no. We, Again, we just firmed up Karen and oh. Peter's participation last night and this morning. Yeah. So clearly, soon, um, no later than the beginning of next week. Okay. Yeah, we're I have a little bit of outreach I'd like to do before that goes out. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to do a little bit of personal connecting with yeah. a couple places. And we just figured 3.30 Tuesday, we're going to try and, and confirm our stuff as our group. And so yeah. hopefully by then, yeah, you've done I your outreach and we, we might... Like and I'll, we'll let you know, the committee though, that now we're, we're firm as a time date. And, um, but that's certainly the purpose of this update is to make sure everyone who you haven't been sitting on the conversations have your questions answered now. Yeah. This is great. This is such a helpful update to know yeah. what's going on. That's fabulous. I don't know why you want to add anything, but. No, that's great. Okay. Yeah, good. Um, Wally? Uh, comprehensive Long Range Plan uh, Planning Committee had a public forum on Saturday at high school, three hours. Uh, I'd say there were probably 30, 35 people there who weren't committee members. 
um, and a pretty exhaustive review of what we've learned to date from the information we've gathered. Um, there will be a, a, public, a public hearing on the 16th of November at Willard, 7 o'clock, um, and that's for people to come you know, give input. Sorry, did you, did you say that date again? Uh, the 16th of November. November? Yeah. Well, don't busy run that week. That's a busy week. Busy week. <laughs> don't make any plans that week. Yeah. Um, I'm traveling that week. And uh, <laughs> okay. so that, and, you know, we're, so we're getting to the point where, uh, you know, we've gathered a lot of information and we'll start to try to assimilate some of that into what the, what the draft plan is going to be. Okay, great. Um, other liaison reports? We said, uh, I can do a couple quick ones. Um, one just that uh, was at the chair's breakfast recently, which again is all the chairs of committees and commissions in town. Um, good representation there. Uh, we gave our update. I think the only thing is really relevant update out of it would be I think that uh, Carl Packard, who was there as chair of the finance committee, kind of reiterated and agreed with us that we are moving forward in a good collaborative way with them. So that was a nice affirmation. Um, Bob was there as well. We were both there. I don't know if there's anything else that we report back from that. Um, mostly just, just updates from other committees. Um, Bob and I were also at the PTG president's meeting. Um, and I think coming out of it, it was just, we came out thinking this is a very good forum for getting some really good feedback from these schools. And on tap for next month is a good discussion about kind of roles of the PTG and what they should be funding and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think there's some, we're, we're eliciting some good questions and possible discussions with them that I think will give us some more good insight into what's going on at each of those sites. So that was a good introduction. And last, um, on the middle school, um, as we discussed before, while we're waiting for the MSBA to get back to us, we're gonna do some educational visioning about where we wanna be. So we've started that process. We had a planning meeting with about probably 15 people, I would say eight of them or so middle school teachers and administrators. Uh, to lay out that process, uh, which will be running over the next few months. It's going to be very inclusive of, of many people, probably a 30 to 50 person group, and then also have public forums, a public forum at least, for anybody to come to. Um, so that group is working on that. We're figuring out schedules over the next couple months, but it's moving along, and, and um, people seem pretty excited about where it's going, I think. So that's making good progress. Uh, and I think that's it. I don't have anything. Other updates. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. We're on the no. super the superintendent report. Great. Thank you. I'll open by just updating you on my entry plan. Uh, I have essentially completed my face-to-face -face interviews and uh, forums and gathering of uh, first-hand information. The second layer of feedback was gathered through surveys, so I'm really thrilled with the response that I've had. 107 teachers, 253 parents when I pulled the data, the data, and because I asked Mike to do it during their advisory block, I have 856 <laughs> kids, so I think that's great. Um, Good choice. You know, just anecdotally, I've had opportunities to meet with a number of different principals of the day and a couple of the different schools, and our kids are so articulate and they're so thoughtful even in this, this survey that I just approached Justin and Mike about some sort of superintendent's advisory council where I can come and meet with them regularly because, I mean, to just even be with a seventh grader for an hour, I believe with such thoughtful feedback and ideas and, um, you know, it's really important that I keep that line of communication yeah. open. So my next step is to dive into all of that and then the December time frame I'll be putting it all together for themes across all of the discussions and all of the surveys and all of the data and documents that I've been looking at and give you some takeaways which are going to flow really nicely into the strategic planning process because that will allow me to participate that in that process as a pretty informed person, not the right. random one off the street, um, while we gather feedback in a structure that allows us to drive what our next goals are going to be. So in terms of that process, um, we've been talking with the consultant, and the next step we're listening for dates down, so we're going to try to figure out what those best look like. 
Um, the process loops back and forth between the administrative team and the planning team. So the leadership team really is the administrators because they're the ones doing the work and have a lot of first-hand knowledge. The planning team is that another broad spectrum of stakeholders, 35 or so, plus community forums to gather feedback. Um, and then they kind of loop back and forth with each other so that by the end you've got a really informed, thoughtful plan that is doable. I think that's why the <laughs> I think that's why the leadership stays a midpoint in between. Right. So they leave with a comprehensive plan that's really really realistic. Yeah. Um, so we're looking forward to getting that started again, the dates of the next piece. So once we set dates, we can start to talk who the stakeholders will be. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll certainly be bringing that, those updates to you over the next few meetings so that we could get started in January. Great. Uh, mindfulness, we've had two meetings now, the Strategic Planning Committee, which is a broad range of teachers from across the district. Um, we've reviewed a SWOT analysis they did last spring. Um, this past meeting we broke out into elementary and secondary to really reflect on where we are and um, which is going to be the precursor to where we want to go. So our next meeting will focus on visioning work and I'm looking forward to hearing how I, I, I try to balance my participation with a lot of listening. So I'm looking forward to hear what the vision is and the next steps. Um, we've talked on the cultural piece. I'll go to communication and collaboration. I have mirrored my report against my goals just so you can, we can track them as the year goes on. It's a nice structure for me. I hope it helps us all stay on. I think it's very helpful. On par with what we said we were going to work on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, communication collaboration are huge ones. I could have written four pages for you just on that. Um, I'm very focused on spending time in classrooms and about two to three schools a week, and it is it does matter. Um, both for me, it's my mental health. I have to say, <laughs> it's absolutely my mental. Health. I was in a high school social studies room Friday afternoon, thinking, oh, I'm fine. I'm just gonna stay for a minute. I, I think I left 20 minutes later. <laughs> I was participating by then. It was a small great. class of the teachers. You know, I don't know. It was great. So uh, that will continue to be a priority. I I toured the Peabody student and principal the day Justin was tied up. So I said, well, he had to cancel his appointment with me, and I said, well. Let me have your principal for now. <laughs> so he walked me around. Um, I did meet with Jessica Murphy and the CPAC group this past month. They had invited us. Um, other community groups continued to interact with me regularly. Uh, Concord on Tab, the Center for Parents and Teachers, Concord Youth Services. Today, the Concord Education Fund visited our administrative meeting, which was fantastic. They created a new liaison position to help streamline the grant process. So we're all excited about that. It's just going to be tighter communication. So the administrators are in the loop earlier. But a couple grants like we were really ambitious teachers received grants that the principal didn't know about. So it's just <laughs> it all. It's gonna be fantastic. And that was all the Ed Funds initiatives that were what they great. saw that wow. there was a place to process them. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I've set monthly meetings with Carlisle Superintendent Jim O'Shea so that uh, we stay synced up. Um, and I have at least monthly meetings with the CTA and CCTA, which have been really positive. So, that is where I'm spending most of my energy while we get all the other business work done, but it's been really great. And what's so well received, it's just satisfying and fulfilling to find the time and make it a priority. That's great. Um, response to intervention, those, that's one of our academic goals and across the district goals and the improvement plans, and it's in a lot of the educator goals that we, we're looking at those today as well. Um, I've been able to look at some of the data with the schools. I attended a fifth grade meeting at Alcott. Um, we're now looking at the MCAS scores. We'll have to figure out what the best time is to bring you some of that data that just, just came out this past week. Um, and CMS, we're now trying to, secondary is a little harder challenge with the intervention models, so we're really trying to dive in. Um, the middle school has the structure and the schedule, the high school is harder to find the harder to and is that part of the yeah. review that's happened at the special ed review? Uh, that's that's thing, or is that different focus. from response? Certainly, certainly, yes, it is. We definitely had conversations with them last week about what intervention looks like. Okay. That was broader than just that because it also was all about other special education programs. Right, yeah. Um, and all the components of what our structures look like at the high school. But absolutely, they, I was there when they asked us about the regular education side of okay. what we're doing. Because mm -hmm. those are not ever going to be a separate Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, I think we'll get great feedback from them on the, the intervention piece, even though their focus is special ed. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, the Innovation Lab, I gave you updates on the educational side. Uh, we're looking at kicking off pilot work, both at the whole school and fifth grade level. 
starting in December with uh, all of the kids and then grade five will start coming over to Ripley in January. The materials are coming in from the CEF monies that we have to purchase supplies and materials. <coughs> We've strategized storage for those uh, materials yeah. um, and we'll be anxious to have them. John and I are still working with OMR on some of the planning pieces we need, so we're pretty yeah, basically we're going to, uh, we're awaiting input from one of the consultants. It's not OMR directly, it's a SAS consultant to them. Uh, we're awaiting some additional information from the structural engineer, and then we can finish the bid package. And we've uh, indicated to OMR that we are uh, getting very concerned about uh, getting those plans. There's some structural things going on in OMR. Right. We'll leave it at that for now, but yeah. um, we're working with them tightly this week. Yeah. Uh, Spanish and Latin, I just left as a reminder of what an outstanding success, especially Spanish, has been the past couple of weeks. Yeah. I, I, the kids are just thrilled. It's been so engaging and active, and they're singing and dancing and all of that. I'd like to bring um, a few a Spanish teacher and some kids too, maybe for the November I think that would meeting. Be fun. To, My kids are singing at home in Spanish. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's coming home. It's yeah. fabulous. It's been real, really, really, really successful. <laughs> yeah, that's so. awesome. Uh, that's that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Lori. The biggest question I have every time you go through all this is, how do you fit all this into a week? <laughs> <I know. laughs> I'm, I'm busy. I'm going to admit to that. <laughs> and I have a lot of help. It's not a one person <laughs> yeah. an activity any of it. Well, Among Lori's many talents is functioning on two hours of sleep. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Five or six. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so correspondence. Yeah. I don't have any CBS correspondence, I don't think. Yeah, yeah I, I have um, correspondence from the Harlem Lacrosse Executive Board. Um, they had a... Um, Harlem Lacrosse Clinic and Tournament. Uh, it was last two week, two weekends ago, I believe. And I have a letter from them that I, they'd asked us, they'd asked us to read it's from the Harlem Lacrosse Executive Board. On behalf of Harlem Lacrosse, we would like to extend our sincerest thanks to the Concord and Concord, Concord and Carlisle communities for participating in the sixth annual Harlem Lacrosse Weekend. This year, 25 families from Concord and Carlisle opened their homes to 90 of our students from Harlem. Weekend activities included a lacrosse clinic on Saturday morning, followed by a tour of the Old North Bridge and the Concord Museum, the Old Man's and the Robin's House. The weekend culminated in a lacrosse tournament at CCHS on Sunday that drew 500 participants. Special thanks go, goes to the 50 CCHS Boys and Girls Lacrosse players who volunteered and helped coach the 30 participating teams. These high schoolers excelled in their roles as mentors and coaches and displayed strong leadership skills. In a brief time frame, they were able to mold their players comprised of youth from different geographies, backgrounds, and lacrosse abilities into cohesive teams. Concord and Carlisle can take pride that Harlem Lacrosse was founded by 2004 CCHS graduate and lacrosse player Simon Cataldo. Simon learned the value of public education, diversity, and empathy growing up in Concord and learning in its public schools. Those values that are embodied by our community are now intrinsic to our local partnership with Harlem Lacrosse. From its founding in 2011 with only 10 players in one city, Harlem Lacrosse now serves 1,000 students and is in five cities. We are especially proud that Harlem Lacrosse now has a presence in Boston and is serving 150 students at three public schools in Mattapan and Dorchester. And it was submitted by, as I said, the Harlem Lacrosse Executive Board, Maureen Dibble and Louis Salim. What a great program. I just want to add, I was up there for about a half an hour. Yeah, it was, it was really incredible. It was. I mean, tremendous competition and, you know, I counted 400, so I was pretty close. I did, I, uh, when I walked back from the top of the hill, I looked down and I said, 50, 50, 50, 50. So it was five. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it's a great event. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes. I was picking leaves. And I, I don't have any other correspondence from the region. I don't either. Do you have anything else? Okay. 
Then on to our. Oh yeah, we have one. We have one thing. John, do you want to? I'm just going to bring it up on the old bits of the photo of the very old bits. John, you want to hold it for that? Or now is fine. Whatever you want. Well, I can give everybody a brief hold. Of okay. Because I think it is something worth discussing. So back around 2006 or so, uh, there was some interest expressed by some of the galleries about placing towers at a couple of sites, including uh, San Juan, or, uh, fairly close to San Juan, and also on the high school. Uh, the San Juan RFP would have been handled by the town pocket, and the regional RFP would. We, we never actually issued the RFP, if my recollection, in 2006. Uh, there was discussion with the school committee, and a decision was made, made at that time not to go forward to it because uh, essentially uh, the returns were not as lucrative as the returns that are in discussion now. And also the regional finances uh, back then were a lot stronger than they are now. So the conversations I've had with representatives of Verizon Wireless are indicating that there could be three or four carriers that would respond, and the revenue from each of the carriers could be as high as thirty to forty thousand dollars a piece times two. And in addition to that, and this is an interesting thing, they're going to structure the RFP in a manner that uh, requires the carriers to replace a light bulb at their expense. So this. As you know, we've had some conversations about improvements, uh, a possible warrant article for paving the access road to the high school okay. campus and also and needing new lighting improvements. So there's some interesting dimensions here, given given the uh, given the region's finances and what we're seeing happening to our EV percentages. Uh, I, I think it's something that we still need to tell you that back in 2006, uh, around 2006, there was some backlash from some community members who got in South Towers. There was some concerns about safety. Uh, I, I believe that they've diminished. There is an existing uh, bylaw that requires that uh, South Towers not be placed within a thousand feet uh, of schools. Uh, Middlesex. Middlesex is going through the process now. And what I've been told by uh, Verizon, uh, by the representatives that have approached us, doesn't mean that Verizon would necessarily be the winner, but they, they have an interest in it. They've been tasked with improving Verizon self service, and confident this is one of the ways they would do it. There will be other carriers that are interested in the sites as well. Uh, they are confident that uh, the bylaw is under, uh, can be. Uh, <laughs> so, Thank you. Just, just want to give you some awareness of it. The thought would be to bring it to you as a formal agenda item in November, so we could more thoroughly talk okay. about it and obviously make sure the public was involved in the conversation. So but, sorry, just on that bylaw, and sorry, I can hear you because I was sneezing. Um, the, the bylaw, you said they're confident that, what? That it could be waived. It could be which is what they did in the Middlesex case. They went to the Zoning Board of Appeals. They granted it. Now a group of neighbors are suing. I heard a lot of people. Right. There's yeah. a lot of controversy. The Zoning Board of Appeals. And, uh, so, so one of the questions I asked, uh, I, because I, was, I remember the, the pushback years ago, and it was, it was health related back then. Mm -hmm. And I asked the gentleman uh, today, what was the nature of the feedback that they're getting on the middle sex thing? And he said, it's the height of the polls. So these polls are 100 feet high. But if you think of our campus, uh, and they, the lighting would not be 100 feet high. The lighting would be at the appropriate height that's needed to illuminate. It wouldn't be a big light way up in the sky spreading and so forth. So uh, it was the height of the poles. Those poles on the campus on that road would not necessarily be something for you folks to consider, but I don't think it would be as disruptive to the vision, the visual piece as, as over at Middlesex. sense. So John uh, and Lori, you envision uh, either the 14th or the 28th of next month 
um, to more formally present the issue to yeah. school committee and we take it from there. Yeah, yeah so that what, it would, what would need to happen there would be, there would be instruction to, to my business office to issue the RFP. We would issue an RFP, we would evaluate it, and then we would make a recommendation to the school committee. Okay. And I'd probably ask uh, one, at least one of them to sit in on the evaluation committee council or something like that. Well, whatever you think. Okay. Is that an annual payment? Or yes, it's so an annual stream. Yeah. Okay. A lot of questions bubbling, but we'll discuss yeah, it later. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. let you know. Okay, great. Good to know. Yeah. There. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. If you have questions, that might be helpful to get them to us before the meeting we have, so we're sure to yeah. get all the answers. Okay. Great. Just want to introduce yep. Ian. Yep. They, they, they will likely be some high community interest, so we will uh, we probably want to go into it in depth at a Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, are we done with correspondence? We're on to I think so. reports for discussion. On to First so, up is enrollments. Yeah, October 1 enrollments. So you can guide me on how detailed discussion you want to have on the October enrollments. We gave you uh, 16 and 17 so you could see comparisons. There's a lot of data to dive into here if you'd like to dive into. Uh, you can see the totals for the high school, which are three students different from last year. Uh, Peabody and Sanborn as a middle school are up, about, are up nine kids. Alcott. There's some increase there, and we did have a teacher as an outcome. Um, so that's probably the biggest bump. Uh, Thoreau is down 10, and Willard is actually down 15. Um, when you look at it from the global view, which is the second page, you can see uh, just in terms of class size across the district, uh, K is up a little bit. Uh, grade one is down 30 kids. Uh, two has the shift the other direction. Uh, three is a 20 student difference. Four is essentially flat. Um, and five has a 10 student difference. So it all totals to a 10 student difference, but you, the challenge is always that it depends on the pockets and where they are and which school and trying to track and predict. Um, you can also see the comparisons. K8 overall is in absolutely 100% the same number as it was a year ago, <laughs> which we couldn't have done. Crazy. Um, and then the high school is different of three students. So I think probably for our purposes, given that there's a fairly static amount, you know, the changes are within 10 and 15 kids each in pretty broad bands. Um, to me, it's more the longitudinal data that as you look at the high school numbers and then look at the K-5 numbers, you, you know, there's some significant changes happening there. Uh, and we know that Carlisle's down some now. We'll have to work with them to predict what their lower grades are going to be. But there could be impact down the road at the high school, which maybe isn't a bad thing. I think it could probably use a little bit of breathing space. Honestly, yeah. but impact going down. The yeah. impact of the younger kids coming up, right? But the but K-5 population is definitely smaller. But than the, so the net will be down at the high yes. school. Yes. Thank you. Do these numbers for the high school include Carlisle, or are they just kind of? They are, yes. They so that's some of the Carlisle, difference. Carlisle, Setco, uh, students and staff, and any other kids that might get assigned there. This is right off of the October 1 Desi report that we submitted to everybody. <coughs> and with, and as we talked about within the high school population, the two, the, the two demographic pieces that are measured to determine the assessment are the Concord students and the Carlisle students. Um, one question as we look at the next few years of the middle school, we've mm -hmm. talked about the current 7th and 8th grades being kind of bubble classes, they're pretty large. Um, and so does it, I guess I can look, but I haven't, haven't, haven't quite done all the math, but do we still think that those are bubbles and the next ones coming through or less. So, you know, for the next few years, once the current seventh and eighth grade are out of the middle school, the middle school should get slightly smaller for a few years, correct? It, it's, it's, and the challenge is it's slight, so if it fills in with move-ins and things like that, right. it won't be as 
maybe much of a relief as we had initially hoped. Okay. And then you look at grade two, which is at 241, and you lost, you've even lost the slight right. reduction. That's so, true, yeah. There's um, another bump there. It's hard to say. It definitely, for the next few years, with the current sixth grade and the incoming fourth and fifth, third, fourth, and fifth, you'll get a little bit of reading. Right. Okay. 715 for the middle school is a little challenging. Uh, 7.4 is a little bit more challenging. And so, yeah. The, um, I, I know that the longer you go out with projections, the less reliable they are. But the last pro pro um, projections I, we saw, I believe it was last year, yep. showed for the next five years fairly flat, but right around 1,200, with very little variability. High school? High school, yeah. Um, it seems like for these numbers that it, the next report might show even more variability. Yeah. It, it would appear that would be some mm -hmm. as those younger grades yeah. come up. You can take a little more faith in the high school numbers, the projections, because you know what's in the right. Yeah, right. Grade, right. right. You can see them. Right. So you can, you, can, you can believe in those projections a little more firmly than you can in the yeah. <coughs> yeah. I mean, historically, the game changers are um, housing complexes. Yeah. <coughs> For example, um, I'm blanking on the name of it now. The Muse. The Muse. Um, what, what are we looking at in terms of any there's game some, changers there's, coming there's down the pipe? Potential large projects on the table. As much as 110 units of housing. 110? Yeah. Um, we did different plots. There's one in Wall Road that's 80. And then on, on Main Street and West Concord, it's 20. And uh, there's another one out on the wall side of town that's you know, 20 or 25. Yeah, yeah. Um, but those are, you know, those are in early stage. Um, I'm not sure what the structure will be. If they'll be 55 plus or mixed or whatever. What's the, sort of what's the timeline for those? What's that? What's the timeline? Uh, well, they're all right now, in a, they're all in process of or an accepted bid that the developer is working through the process. Um, what permits and variances would be needed before there's a final deal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it could be a year before anything really gets put in front of community if there's a variance. Mm -hmm. um, could be less, but okay. you know, something like Joanna knows more about the stuff than I do, but that seems to be the Sounds about right. sort of time frame. Oh, the game is in Okay. Big numbers. Okay. Good to be aware of, so thank you. Yeah, yeah, it is. <coughs> All right. So, FY19 budget update. Do you want to take us through the, mm -hmm. that's what we're on next, right? So, yes. this is the process we're working through, and I'll highlight. Please insert the memo. memo. Um, please ask questions and we'll have a good discussion. Uh, this week, right now, last week we spent looking at some certain areas at the central office level. This week, John and I are digging in deep to try to really get the numbers anchored on where we're at and what, what we're trying to get to and how we might get there. Um, next week, we're bringing the uh, principals back through. They've had their budgets now for a few weeks. They've been charged with analyzing those, letting us know of their needs, um, looking for where they might find efficiencies, potential cuts if we need to go that far. Um, so they're all due back to us next week. This morning we talked in some big picture ways on where we were at. Um, next week they'll all come back through. By the end of next week we should have a pretty good sense of where we're at. Um, the question will be, how far are we from where we want to be? <laughs> so okay. I, that's why that next that week after is meant to be a discussion of how do we get to what the target is um, and what is the target? We don't have a FinCom guideline yet, right. so that frame of reference is a guessing game um, in terms of whether we're trying to close to that or how far we are from it. So um, we do have a meeting scheduled next week with the Concord. Well, first we have the Select Board and Finance Committee joint meeting on the 30th, which was postponed from September. We're scheduled to go on the 2nd to the Finance Committee meeting. I don't know if 
Dan and Heather and I had a discussion of asking them to give us a little longer to go next week before you've seen the budget draft on the 14th. Felt a little challenging, but perhaps we could have a less formal conversation to really be productive on where we're at, where they're at, and see what we could figure out. So we're discussing that. Um, we are doing Carlisle on the 6th. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the 7th, the administrative team will see where the final picture has landed as a preview and final tweaking for what we will bring you on the 14th. We do need to talk here as we get to these dates in late November and December. The public hearing I had tentatively put in at the December 12th meeting. John is letting me know there's a bylaw that has a certain number of days prior to, um, but then you, you tell them. <laughs> um, you folks may recall that Dean Banfield uh, raised an issue regarding the, uh, typically for years, the public hearing would adhere to the uh, budget development process and timeline that the finance committee has pointed out to us. We've been adhering to that for all the years I've been here and I presume many years before. But he found, I believe, in state law yes. uh, a regulation that there would be a public hearing before adoption of the, of the, of the uh, school committee budgets. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so we're going to reverse the order essentially of the 28th and the 12th. The 28th will be the public hearing and the 12th will be the approval. I didn't catch that. The 28th would be a public hearing? And the 12th will be? Hopefully we'll be at an approval of what you want to submit for a budget on the 12th. Of November? Uh, December. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the 28th will be, will be a public, public, hearing public hearing at the okay. joint meeting. Correct. Okay. And then the warrants are due when? Well, uh, okay. the warrants will be voted on December 12th. Uh, they need to be submitted typically like the first business day in January. So. So uh, you'll recall that last year the, the, uh, the warrant articles were voted on the second Tuesday of December, I think it might have been or something like that. Uh, but then there was a reload uh, later. There was a, another meeting added right. to it. Mm -hmm. So right. typical flow would be the second Tuesday in December, which this year is the 12th. You conceivably could get another bite of the apple, so to speak, if you were. Questions? We're that looks spending a lot of time on it. So yeah. yeah. Great. I, I mean, my, so my comment is just that thank you for doing this so yeah. thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly there's great thought and work going into this process, and it all makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So whatever we bring you in that first pass in the 14th will be as thoughtful and uh, effective as we could get to. Mm -hmm. See how close we are to the FinCon guideline based on what we feel is an educationally sound budget, and then we can figure out where we go. Yeah. Okay. Great. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so next up, we have school committee goals. Um, so I will kind of take this because I drafted these these versions, at least these drafts. Um, so there are two linked here. There's Concord School Committee and Concord Carlisle School Committee. What I did was took kind of all of the versions that we had and tried to sync them up, um, mostly in the form of the one that Joanna had sent, and I added in some things that other people had provided um, and just kind of edited to try to synchronize all of them. Um, the two documents are almost the same except for each of them has an individual goal that doesn't relate to the other. Um, so most of them are dual goals and read exactly the same on each one. On the Concord Carlisle one, goal or H is the High School Campus Advisory Committee, and on the Concord School Committee one, goal H is the Concord Middle School Facilities Planning. So that's where they differ. Um, now, I'm not sure how much people have gone through it. Do you want me to walk through them at a high level, or have you looked at them enough? Um, I, I read through them, I thought you did a great job bringing, okay. bringing them all together. Thank you. Of yeah. all the comments yeah. and all the different and, and I want to point out, Joanna, that you were an important middle step between taking my oh. sort of rudimentary list and really fleshing it out into a nice form. I appreciate that, and having yeah. taken in the final Much few yards there, I appreciate it. Great. Um, the uh, second key action under budget development process 
Yes. Um, that's not really part of the charge of the subcommittee. Some of that may happen, but okay. it's not something that we are actively doing. Wait, say that again? So the second one says budget. Yeah. Second bullet. Let me just read it out. It says budget subcommittee will work closely with finance committee to better educate and understand each committee's roles in budget development. Not part of the charge? Not part of what we're doing. With with the working group from FinCon is really specifically about benchmark. I think it also could be included in the first bullet if we decided that we wanted to do it so I couldn't hear you, Melissa. What? I was just saying I think that it's it's potentially repetitive of the first bullet. Okay. Mm. Yep. We can just take it out. Yeah. Yeah, probably covers it. Yeah, sure. Okay. I think I would just take it out. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, other comments? Basically, we have you know the budget itself. We have the budget <coughs> review pro process. We have superintendent support and evaluation. We have the strategic plan, community engagement and communication. We have the calendar. We have cultural proficiency. Do we want to address that term? Do we do we still want to call it proficiency after the discussion we had earlier? Do we want to call it awareness, or do we want to stick with what we have? It's an interesting point that was brought up. Awareness, understanding, and proficiency. I mean, it's it's a lot of things. things. I know. Does proficiency align with uh, with assessment um, evaluation, right. teacher, and uh, administrator that's evaluation? Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's the official term. That's the official term yeah. in the evaluation. So we may so. want to keep yeah. the term, but I think that's, I think it's a good point. Yep. But as we as we communicate out. We do out. things within the schools. Cultural awareness is probably a better term. Okay. Good point. It was a great point. I mean, it, it was yeah. a great point. And I, I'll, I think awareness isn't strong enough. <laughs> I, I totally understand and agree with the point about proficiency. I don't think awareness is strong enough. Yeah. There's that's a lot of things I'm aware of. Yeah. yeah. That's but I want more for cultural awareness. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, I agree. I don't think you are. Yeah, right. yeah. Proactive inclusiveness right. and understanding. Right. Yeah. I mean, when, when, when it got off the ground 15, 20 years ago, EMI, which has now morphed into ideas that EDCO has taken under its wing, um, it was just called anti-racist training. And it, it now has become a much broader title of cultural proficiency. My guess is in five years we'll be talking about something else. Right. Yeah. Um, that it'll, it'll evolve. Um, yeah. But we should definitely have an open mind about that term proficiency. All right. For now, given that it's what's in the standards, we'll leave it as is in our goals. Um, then we jumped here and, uh, on the Concord side. It's the Actually, middle school. I have oh. something on the uh, CPS campus advisory committee. Yes. Uh, you said goal is June 18. It probably should read April 18. April 18. That's okay. one of those two reports that do. Got it. I think that's in the uh, charge. In the it? charge. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's a good point. April 18th. Okay. Thank you. Um, similar on the, on the Concord side, we have the Concord Middle School facilities planning point there. Mm -hmm. um, and then both of them have assessing protocols, which we're about to do next on our agenda. Um, that's it. Any other comments or anything? That's easy. I can make those two edits. Mm -hmm. um, and then are we, oops, I forget. We are we voting on these, these tonight? As, What's that? As, do we want to adopt these as yeah. edited? Yeah. Yes, I think we can yeah, sure. do that. I don't think it's on our, it's not on our it's list on of our votes, list. but I think that yeah. <laughs> given that we've discussed it a few times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you like a motion? Do I have a motion to adopt the Concord School Committee and Concord Carlisle, let's do them separately. Yeah. Do I have a motion to adopt the Concord School Committee goals as amended for 2017-2018? So moved. Second. Um, any more discussion for Concord? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? 
Can I get a motion for adopting as amended the Concord Carlisle Regional School District goals? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? All right. All right. Thank you. Well done. We've agreed on our goals. <laughs> Um, good, that was pretty quick. Next one, practices and policies and protocols. We've got a lot of terms on this one. Principle. Principles, right. So what I did on this one, um, and this is completely just feel free to say that was a horrible idea, let's tear it up and start over. Um, but we had a protocols document and we had a practices document. Um, and as we were discussing things, as all of us, most of us were discussing things at our kind of who does what and how we proceed session uh, a few weeks back, it, it, these were all kind of melding together and we were, it wasn't a clear distinction between protocols and practices. And we were finding ourselves with kind of some guiding principles and then there were meeting practices and there were between meeting practices. That's how it seemed to break out to me. So I threw them all together and broke them out that way. Um, I am completely open to input or feedback if you feel like this is effective or not effective. We can go back to splitting them some other way. Uh, and there are some new things in here, which I should. So I guess first kind of concept wise, feel free to any feedback and then I can highlight the new things as I look at them. I would say concept wise, I liked it. I thought it mm -hmm. made sense and I liked the way you um, broke it down. Um, and the only question would be, as, as if, if we agreed we like this structure, whether it's an operating protocols or operating bylaws or right. operating principles. What we call it. The principles. Right. What you call it. I don't really, I can't always really define protocol I know. practice. Yeah. Right. So maybe protocol is the right word. But I'm not sure. It's, I don't know. Too. Or bylaws. We, we had that, that was a suggestion recently. Is that. I know, like protocols better. Practices, you know, yeah. you, you no, I lost this one. Right, bylaws sounds, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, very official. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, um, I'll throw out a fourth word. Because <laughs> we need more options. <laughs> um, which I actually, before, I, I just want to consider this fourth word, but I actually like protocols, the word protocols I like. Um, norms. Mm -hmm. But. I, I'm not going to go to the wall on it. <laughs> Anyone? Protocols. protocols. I, I kind of like that too. All right. These sure. are our protocols that, that include guiding principles and meeting practices and, and between meeting practices. Um, the things that are either new or had some discussion, the guiding principles were all pretty standard. Um, I don't think there's anything too new there. Uh, basically, the we'll all play nicely in the sandbox. Um, meeting practices. Uh, most of it's the same agendas for meeting posted, um, committee members being prepared. So public comments was one that we had some discussion about at our Who Does What session. So I tried to capture that discussion here. I know there were some concerns about from some members about comments turning into too much discussion if we didn't control it enough, and some concerns on the other side that we weren't giving people enough chance to respectfully comment. So the way I worded it was, public comments will occur at the start of each regular meeting. Members of the public will use a comment form to request to make a comment. The form provides documentation of name, address, and topic of comment. Chairs will outline comment format, explaining that comments are not to exceed three minutes in our comments only, not a platform for discussion. In the case of high interest topics, a chair may elect to allow comments at relevant times during the meeting. These will still be limited to three minute comments, not forums for discussion. So that was the point that there was the most debate about. Um, does that feel comfortable to everybody? Did I capture it? I just have a question. Yes. So in here somewhere, is, is there a situation where a bullet or a Something that allows, that if something arises, similar to, consider the situation where you have an action item that occurs and you have to, you have to take the exception to the practice of 
Yeah, so we were going to put, oh, we were going to talk that, about that. That's right, about voting. Like that we didn't. Uh, yeah. that had right. to that. We that didn't. Like that. Well, we don't have the opposite, though, either. We don't have the opposite yeah. either. Right. We should address it, though. But if you're going to use the word protocol, there, there is, because I just Googled Because <laughs> I was concerned that, that this is, I, I believe that there's a little difference, there's a nuance, and I'm looking at the list. Mm -hmm. uh, protocol and practice, because protocol is described as the official. So to change your protocol on the fly when uh, an emergency or something needs to be addressed quickly is probably uh, more challenging than right. the word practice. Okay. So if there's something in here that allows within the protocol to deal with that type of situation, that would be a good idea. So That's that being point. said, that this, if this is listed under the meeting practices, but the whole document is the protocols, which are, we, are you allowed to change on the fly using? I mean, you can always put in a disclaimer at the bottom that yeah. says yeah. you will exercise the changes as needed. You know? Yes. How about calling them operating principles and practices? Yeah. Operating principles and practices. I like it. Norms. What about the norms? Norms. <laughs> Operating norms? No, I think, I think uh, that covers norms. it Just more norms. accurately. Which? Principles and practices. Principles and practices. Help it I know, and it was Cliffy, right? <laughs> and practices. Okay. I've got that. that and um, I've got, we're going to add a disclaimer, no matter what we put in here, we're going to add a disclaimer at the bottom that in cases of necessity, we may need to change our practices at any given time. Do you think it's clear enough that the comments during the meeting is at the chair's discretion? Um, in the case of that's why I wrote it as may elect, but if that uh, yeah, I mean that's how I read it, but I just I'm concerned about if someone really wants to talk and yeah, uh, that the chair has enough authority to say this is not a time for public. Comments I would right like now. to say something about like in the chair's sole discretion. Sure. So that when the chair doesn't want to do it for some reason, that may be valid. Um, it can be crystal clear that it's the, the chair's prerogative. And, and I think it's clear now, but if we could use the term sole discretion, I think that would be Yeah, good. sure. Can we do that? I mean, I was going to say on that point that we should almost encourage the chair to allow comments on high interest topics. You know, it, it improves the experience that audience members have coming to our meetings. It's very important we get input from the community. So that, that, that's my personal take on it. Yeah, and so this this is where there is some well, sure. there is some yeah, yeah. debate here. I know some of us feel like we should encourage that more. Some were concerned that that can become um, more of a discussion. No, That's also why I, I specifically put in here that the chairs should outline at the beginning of the comment section how it's supposed to work. Because and I will say right now, I think that was one of my failings in a couple of earlier meetings, when, and I didn't outline it, and it kind of the. the comments started to become discussions and ran away with us. Um, and I felt looking back at it like, well, I could have done a much better job controlling it if I had outlined up front how the comments would work. Um, if it gets to but, be a problem, you know, you, you gotta stick to the three minute rule and right. there's no discussion. This is, these are comments. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, see. See. I don't think I was here for the discussion or something. Um, there are two ways this could come about. I mean, we know it's a high interest item. You will want to say that at the outside of the meeting so that those con people who have comments on that right. topic right. may hold them exactly. until then versus the beginning of the meeting. Right. And then it may become apparent to us, even though we didn't know, that there was a high interest item, that there's a high interest item, or it turns into a high interest item, as we're discussing. Right. Um, so there's two. Mm -hmm. That's true. I think you know, I, 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 if I were the chair, I would want the latitude to be able to do both of those. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's what this says. I was just saying, I think that gives you the latitude, doesn't it? I think it's the chair. That's what that says. I, I just, um, I think at that point we're getting into the point where we should be holding a forum. Well, that if it's high interest enough that the, you know, the, the maybe it's merits of a separate yeah, targeted discussion. That's true. Um, because when you go back to MASC, MASC makes a very significant point that this is not a public meeting, this is not a town meeting, this is a meeting held in public. So I just want to yeah, no, that, I think articulate that's a very, the other side of the coin. That's a very good point, but different communities have different standards Absolutely. as to communication. And yeah. I think Concord is in a, in a place where we should ought to allow, allow that. In that's, the, I think that's fair. I just, yeah. I just want to make a point that, you know, a forum is a great place to It gets to, to that, that level, level that maybe. <laughs> well, I think it's important what about that this? the chair needs to control this. Yes. Um, I am, I, I sort of lean to the other side, that I think allowing public comment during the meeting, I, I've seen very few instances where exactly. I thought that got out of hand. Yeah. Um, right. And uh, you know, I guess I mean, I think if people take the time to come to a meeting and express an opinion before we vote, it, uh, it's, I, I certainly feel I can give the extra three minutes a person on a topic out of my time to hear what they have to say before. I think at the outset, the parameters need to be very clear, though, because it has happened in my two and a half years in the committee that very quickly that slippery slope, we went down it and it got into a discussion with people between us and folks in the audience. Um, you just have to be very careful, be very careful that it doesn't turn into a public forum because that's not what we do in our meetings. Well, that's why I like the way, that's why I like the way this yeah. is articulated. Yes. Because um, it allows for future chairs, you know, not just us, in this one moment of looking at it closely, to have something to tie to to say, it's not, a, you know, and allow for that control of, you know, that, that the comments absolutely are fine, but not to be in a conversation and not to get drawn into what would know, be a more right. public forum. But these are our yeah. parameters yeah. and rules for comments. I'm not the, uh, you know, and I'm not trying to stifle you, but these, these are the and, parameters and, we have to follow. And in the high interest of what sometimes are emotional issues that we deal with, um, the chair, me included, um, needs to be ready to remind people several times during the meeting, because emotions can get the best of us, that just remember, we're happy to hear from you, we want to hear from you, keep it to three minutes, and this is a business meeting, we're, we're not going to have a debate, but we're happy to hear your comments. Because um, somebody may think of something out there and, and want to say something. Um, so we should have, the chair should have the latitude and at the same time reiterate the, the um, protocols, practices, norms that right. we have. <laughs> um, as a model, I'm not sure if everybody's been to a select board meeting in Concord, but there they tend to kind of open for, I say open generally, for comments after Absolutely. most discussion topics. Absolutely. It doesn't tend to become forum style. It doesn't tend to become a big discussion, um, and it, it's not, it doesn't feel like, I don't think, many comment sections. It just, if there's something that people want to comment on, they can generally make a, a succinct comment. Yeah. Um, I mean, the last is that a model that everybody here is comfortable with, though, and, you know, as, as it's happened there, or, and does this give enough, I mean, does this give us enough control? I guess for those who are worried about the control aspect, does this wording give us enough control? Okay. Yeah. You I, comfortable with this, Lauren? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the hardest ones are those really emotional conversations. Right. Every other meeting, this is not. Right. Like it's it's, 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 it's not not it's relaxed yeah. enough, it's fine to have some little bit of comment right. along the way. It's, it's really about how you're going to manage the really challenging ones, having yes. already experienced a very challenging public <laughs> environment. Um, I, you know, I, I, there might be times you don't 
necessarily benefit from having all that anger come at you at this meeting versus a forum where we, right. we sort of had a little different way to let them talk and dialogue with us. But right. That's when you can predict it. So <laughs> that's the other time. Yeah. That's well, that's why I say I go back to this. This allows for it. I think it does. Um, allows for the control. And okay. in Good. most cases, I feel like we've known what's coming, hmm. and maybe we sync up on, you know, let's remember how we're going to write it. What our strategy yeah. is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That makes sense. Well, the, the one I was thinking about for the forum was the pledge of allegiance issue a few years ago. Oh yeah. And um, that was so much more appropriate for a forum oh, yeah. than a school. Forum. Yeah. Right. Well, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. There, there yeah. are times when yeah. it can Absolutely. Be and if you can preempt that, so for instance, when, the, when there was so much upset about the buses at the beginning of the year, Lori was able to schedule a forum mm -hmm. before, or at least it was scheduled before we had our school committee meeting. So we had a couple of commenters at the school committee meeting, but I think if you hadn't already scheduled a forum, we would have had crowds. Mm -hmm. right. But since we'd scheduled the forum, it gave them a voice and a place to speak. And so I think. And I encourage them to come use the form as a place where we can really talk. Exactly. About versus exactly. Be like one item of right. a whole bunch of other things we were trying to get. To. Right. So I think you're right. As long as we know that something's coming up, if we think there's that much discussion, we should definitely try to create a forum, an environment where people can place, discuss. Yeah. Because it's also probably wildly frustrating to have yeah. that anger or frustration right. or yeah. emotional. You know, feeling right. and, then and come and be told it. three minutes. And nobody, thank you. Nobody right. responds to you. Yeah, I always felt like that's just that feels so terrible. Exactly. So I think it's the writing is fine, and the practices even mention the forum issue. Um, I just think it's very important that the person or persons in charge of the meeting is, is quite clear. Yeah. Yep. That, that's so including the sole expression point. of the chair. Yep, and I will I will add in in this chair sole discretion. Okay, I'll do that one. Um, and the next point is school committee members acknowledge that school committee meetings are business meetings that are held in a public setting. So we have that here too. Um, at times we'll hear reports, um, and I added in these cases the chairs or superintendent will clearly communicate goals and time frame for said reports. Um, we'll respectfully use technology. We've always had that. Um, we'll use a consent calendar as appropriate. We've had that in the past as well, and try to keep try to keep Concord public stuff um, either at the beginning or the end of regional meetings when possible. Um, between the meetings, uh, into, there was some discussion at our who does what session about agenda setting. So I tried to give this a little more detail that in between the chairs and superintendent will meet to establish the agenda. Agendas will be planned based on a yearly schedule of regular topics, the current year's goals, and other issues as they arise. If members have requests for topics to be placed on an agenda, they should submit their requests to their committee chair or chairs. Is that, so, yes. Yeah, that, that sounds good. The only question I have there is when are the agenda meetings taking place? So if I want something added to the agenda, I obviously would should know the date when the agenda is set. Oh. Well, that's true. We, I mean, I don't know how much we've we got a pretty strict calendar about ten, believe it or not, nine days ahead of the meeting. Nine yeah. days ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Concord one's been a little. It's more. more fluid. It's twelve. Twelve days. Twelve meet. days. Yeah, twelve yeah. days. Well, we meet Thursday. Have. Right. We meet the Thursday. That's almost. Oh two yeah, days like before. we meet a week before it has to be posted. Yeah. 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 Right. So it's but 12 days We can, days we can add things to yeah. it. Yeah. We can add things, yeah. yeah. So, yeah but I, mean, I mean, I don't want to put in here every, you know, agenda planning meeting is going to be 12 days in advance, because no. it won't always be for the future, but. Just a point of information. Yeah. Okay, I, I okay. I think it's just good that we know what. Yeah. Just so that you guys yeah. generally know. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, the chairs will represent to the media. The superintendent will manage day-to-day -day operations of the district while school committee exercises leadership, vision, et cetera. Um, we'll channel requests for information, reports, et cetera, through the superintendent. We'll re chairs will apply to correspondence. Um, so I have a, an issue oh, that yes. I don't know how people feel about this. I, felt, I feel that there should be something a little more direct than a timely manner. Oh, I don't know. Okay. How. For which number, Joanne? For Four? when chairs uh, will reply to correspondence. Number five, number yeah. Five. It's their respective school committee in a timely manner. I just feel like it should put be. Put in a note, like, i.e., within. 
I don't know how other people feel. I just think no. it should be directed by, you know, within 48 hours, something that feels comfortable, 24, 48. Sometimes I get, you know, I think it's really important that we... Yeah, I think that's good. People are comfortable with that. Should we say 48 at least? I mean, ideally, I like to do it within 24, but in terms of what we're going to commit right. to in writing, I'd probably say 48 to be safe. Joanna, let me give you a scenario um, and just ask you what you would prefer. Yeah. Um, so when we were soliciting volunteers for the Campus Advisory Committee, we got I think, 17 or 18 mm -hmm. people who were interested. I think, forgive me if I'm wrong, I think I emailed the committee saying, this is my standard reply, something like that. Is that okay to do instead of you get 18 emails with the same exact reply with a different name on it? It's like a form reply. Yes, I is it is it okay? Is it okay if, if, for example, the chair responds to an inquiry like that, the, the form letter reply, um, that we get to tell you just once? Just acknowledging, oh, you mean saying the same thing in one? Versus way. copying everybody. Yeah, so copying copy everybody response. to every reply, and every reply says the same thing. Like, for example, I was telling you, um, yeah. like I, if, I think that's fine. You see what I'm saying? Yes. No, and, but okay. it sounds like it's So I, we had 17 <laughs> different people. Right, You're, are you saying you sent them And I sent them all saying, thank you for your interest, I'll back email. to you. Can I just send an email to the seven committee members and say, hey, this is my standard yeah, reply, FYI? Yes, yes. yeah. 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 Rather than yes. you get yeah. all 18 replies right. that yeah. pretty much the same. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. Yes. Yeah. yes. It's more the people who are, uh, I'm, I'm concerned that the people who email us yeah. get a reasonable response in their yeah, reasonable, yeah. reasonable time. Response like if time. They, they can, you can point to, look, within two days. Yeah, and you. that the rest of the committee is aware of what was said in the reply. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So that's, that's even more important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so I'll add 48 hours. Um, next one, using advisory committees, um, holding public forums for items of high interest, assign observers to town boards and committees, provide liaison to PTGPA presidents, um, school committee chairs may meet informally with select board and finance committee members, uh, chairs or designees will attend monthly chairs breakfast, and committees will review and revise our practices, which we're now gonna call our Principles, so, operating principles and this practices. Is, this is kind of a tiny are. thing, but throughout the par throughout this document, you use they and his and her, and that's the one okay. time you use our. Oh, did I know? Our. our. We'll revise our practices. You're right. Um, we'll revise their. And also, and practice. again, I think I am actually partly to blame because this you lifted this from something I I think I wrote, but that we our practice as needed as part of the self reflection self -action each year. So I would take out as needed. I think what we do, what we're saying we're gonna do is revi review and revise each year. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And so mm. maybe the as needed, it sounds awkward, it's, mm. or it's not. Yeah, yeah. issue observation. Yeah, right. <laughs> what, the what the English teacher said. <laughs> <laughs> it's a word I don't use often. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'll trip over everything. Uh, perfect. Okay, good. Any other thoughts? Or do you want to look back to the discussion? Yeah. Of voting so, items? That's what I was going to oh, ask. Oh, yes. That's right. So we need to add. In meeting practices. In meeting practices. Exactly. If people want to. I thought we decided what to say. Just to say collectively we want to change to doing yeah. voting on the same day? Well, I think it's, yeah. But if you're not putting on it, any limits on it, do you need to say it? I, think I don't think you need to. Yeah, yeah. If you don't. If you don't say that you're going to do a discussion one meeting and then vote the next, then you don't have to say that you can you can put that aside. For, so for just to play devil's advocate, I feel like that's what everyone, at least the the, the groupies that follow the school committee, expects. That's true. And in most things, I don't think it's a big deal. But if they come expecting like it's just the part where they discuss, and then suddenly they find you're going to vote, and they haven't had a chance to comment, and they haven't. But I don't know, I mean, I'm just saying. But the, would, but would you, you call that a norm? <laughs> <laughs> norm. You get the agenda ahead of time, you see what's up for a vote. So it would be up for a vote? Okay. Well, so the yes. challenge there, no, you don't give us more guideline, we assume you're not gonna vote, at least we can talk more on this, obviously, if you're gonna tell me to do differently. So far, we've been assuming that you're not voting the same night you first get it, so it's not listed as a voting action. Which I think is fine. I think Wally's point was one we don't want to be tied to it, right? But I think it. Well, I, my, I can. Well, no. My point was, if we don't, all I said was, if we don't, if we don't say in the 
protocols that, and the practices that we will wait, and we don't need to say we, we cannot wait. Right. We don't need to say that we but don't maybe, have any. Maybe we should. But maybe I, we should make a statement about this. Right. Which I think, I think is what I'm true in general. Sense. And maybe to Joanna's point, we need to just make an announcement of that so people yeah, are aware. Because I think exactly. she's right that yep. there are people who expect yep. that that is a protocol that we follow. Yep. And we often will anyway. We, I mean, I feel more comfortable in general discussing something and then being able to come to the next meeting to vote on it. But there, with a lot of things, but there are some things that we, that we don't need to. Right. You, you know, this really the, is, a, is an issue for the region. Because we meet every two weeks as yeah. CPS. Yeah. Yeah. Right, true. It's the yeah. region yeah. of the month in between. Yeah. And I wonder if we should have a different policy for each. And that, you know, the assumption will be that we will vote on items that we bring up for discussion. Any member can ask for a vote to take it. That's, that's until a good the next idea. Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. And that yeah. way we, you know, we have an expectation that it's a regional item. You see it on the agenda, it's there for discussion, so we're going to vote on it. Um, well, which also example, requires that well, we be more prepared. Right. Um, you know, if we read something and we've got questions about it, we should ask those questions to try to come to some, and if we can't, then and we need the discussion and we need time, then we can, we can say let's stay. So, I, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that the, I was fairly prepared, I just left my mouth. The, um, there are many things that we vote on that don't need a lot of discussion or time to think through. That's right. But there are the things that really we benefit from the time mm -hmm. between. So how do you articulate what, which kind it's going to be? When you know the calendar's coming, we're going to wait. We're not going to vote the same day we see the first calendar. The we're not going to vote on the cell phone tower next time when we first talk about it. Right, but we're going to vote when we have, you know. Yeah, tonight you're going to vote a donation. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, good example. So I don't know, maybe we just have to, maybe it's now that we had the conversation, leave it to the chairs and develop yeah, maybe the agenda. agenda development. Yeah. 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 And if it seems yeah. like it, there's any yeah. any out, um, possibility that the time is needed to kind of think through these, you know. The other thing we could do on the agenda is if there is something that comes up um, that we need to vote on, that we hide. Yeah. We say we this vote. item, this item is time sensitive. Right. Yeah. yeah. Barring unforeseen yeah. circumstances, yeah. Yeah. we anticipate a vote. Right. So maybe it's just being more sensitive to the particular kinds of votes and not worrying about. Yeah. Them. What about the same for every every vote? Stating a general rule of not voting on something that the, the first time is presented, except when the chair determines that there would be no harm or prejudice to the issue. I think or that's kind of what we've had in the and a compelling need. Or there's a compelling or a compelling need that yeah. has a rhythm. Because so if we go back to that, what we what we wanted to get away from was having to vote to not vote or having to right. vote to vote. Right. So, so the so chairs have the, dis have the discretion. Yeah. So maybe it's it's that. It's I feel like it's safer person. if we are not even saying we're going to try to not vote. This can we can, can, can we can we try the approach where the chairs and the superintendent? Yeah. Just kind uh, of yeah. during agenda setting. Right. Yeah. Do it. Decide what, what they're going to do. Yeah. 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 And if, if, you know, two months from now, we're like, that's not working. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or. We'll and we're it. just, yeah. we're you announcing know. right now that yeah. we're not always going to. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, nothing, nothing is preventing anyone from calling a chair when the agenda is released and you get a right. look at it from calling one of us up to say, I, I don't know that I'm going to be ready yeah, right, to vote right. on that. I just want to say, I'm not sure I'm going to be ready. Right. Well, and there's nothing I, I that think says we can't during a discussion. You can't right. right. during right. a discussion. Right. I mean, as late like as the, I, during I, I, the meeting, saying, I'm not comfortable voting. Yeah. 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 And I, I think that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. We vote on you know. whether it's able. Okay. Yeah. So we've agreed not to add anything to our document because there's nothing that we're kind of committing to in writing. Um, to your point, I think we do want to kind of announce somehow that this is a little different from what we've had in the past so that people don't expect that we always discuss one meeting and vote next. So when we made but some adjustments to public comment timing, we spent a few meetings mm -hmm. reminding mm -hmm. 
people that this is we've changed this and this is what we're going right. to do. Yeah. So we can, we can we can do a few that. reminders. I'm that wondering means. on the agenda itself if next to discussion items or action items, both one or the other, we put an asterisk and a little note on the bottom as part of the getting the word out. Yes. So yeah, that perfect. the people like when they get the agendas, they say, oh, okay. Yes. 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 Something in writing somewhere. Yeah. There you go. Good articulation. Yeah. Yeah. And Lori, we can work on the yeah, what that looks like. while we're work talking on that Thursday. While we're talking about votes, we talk about consent agenda. Um, but oftentimes we get to those items and we want to you know, we want to know about them. So if maybe what we should do is go through them with a so we're not doing motion, second, region, blah blah blah. If we go through them. Oh right. And then we do and, and then, then we vote add them consent to the consent. And after. Them. Right. And if somebody wants to call something up, they can. So that we only have to. Yep, that's a good idea. That makes sense. I think, I think that's where it's trying. I don't think it's something we want to. No. Type we're going through them, and it's like any comments, yeah. right, right. any comments, any comments. Yeah. Just comments. Have all our discussions for that, and, and then, then once we discuss the end, them all, we vote. We vote them as a consent. So that, I mean, it's a little time saving. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Good. Um, okay. Good. So. Any we have a con I guess it's a procedural question I have. Are we voting on these or do we just have a consensus that we agree to them? <laughs> <laughs> I think we should. I put know. an asterisk down there and yeah. I, have the I have to make some edits. Okay. You want to bring it back uh, uh, the 14th? Yeah. We'll just vote them. In. Or you, you, could, you could vote them as edited or I can edit them again and bring them back next time. I'll share them with everyone anyway. but. Why don't I edit them and bring them sure. back so that we have the final version yeah. published and linked on everything? Um. Okay. Great. But we got through that. That's good. Uh, All right. Next. So. Yeah. So we have a um, some edits, revisions to a memorandum of agreement between the Friends of Concord Carlisle Playing Fields, otherwise known as FCCPF and the region, Concord Carlisle Regional School District. Um, John, do you, do you feel up to giving us a little context I, I here? I give some background. Uh, it really begins with the Doug White Fields. There's an intergovernmental agreement between the town of Concord and the Concord Carlisle Regional School District that allowed for those fields to be built on regional school district property. That's one piece of it. The next piece to take into consideration is that the Friends of Concord Carlisle Fields having an existing agreement with the town of Concord only regarding the replacement funding and a sinking fund for the Doug White Fields. Over the years, the uh, projected longevity of the fields has increased and the uh, anticipated cost for the replacement has decreased. As a result of that, the Friends of CC, FCCF feel uh, that there is room within the amount of money that they're contributing for the Doug Whitefield replacements, that there's a considerable portion of money, given the changes that I just described, that could be redirected towards uh, mitigating, possibly eliminating, but supporting the eventual field replacement costs for the fields, the artificial turf fields that were uh, donated by Concord Colorado as well. Uh, I began this, I was assigned this project a few years ago. Um, one of the things I pointed out, the Friends of FCCF wanted a three-way agreement uh, on this new funding schedule between uh, the town of Concord, the Doug White Fields, and the regional school district, uh, I recommended that they be separated, the rooms be separated, and that is that that has taken root. It should all, uh, we should not, the regional school district should not be involved in the agreement between the town of Concord and FCCF regarding the Doug White Fields replacement funding. That's a separate issue in my view and, and that's that's been reflected in subsequent events. 
And there was a similar interest in having a three-way agreement between the town of Concord, Friends of Concord, Colorado Field, and the regional school district regarding uh, that movement of funds and establishment of the funds for replacing the lower fields. I also suggested that that should be separated, but that should only be an agreement be between the Friends of Concord Carlisle Fields and the Concord Carlisle Regional School District. No, CC. No, not CC at play. Not CC yet. at play is going to the end of the Oh, okay, I follow you. I follow you. I'm off. sorry, sorry. I follow you. Yep, yeah, sorry, go ahead. It off. Don't, don't listen. Uh, the town of Concord and and the reason I say that is that's just on the finances of replacing the field. That's, that's separate. There is an agreement between the community usage agreement between the town of Concord and the Concord Catalina Regional School District. That's a different uh, document. It's got a different intent. So this, this one here is, is, is about the uh, Potential funding of replacing the low, I should say, the lower fields, the lower artificial turf fields. Okay. The newest one. Not the grass fields. No. Uh, the football field. Just the turf field. If, if, if they'll help us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to clarify. All yeah. of this, all of this, uh, any monies that they generate and put forward, uh, I, I would just point out that uh, in the absence of this, if there's no agreement, and there's no expectation of funds from them. Eventually, there will be a warrant article put forward by the County Carlisle School Committee to be, you know, for both towns to support. It would be likely to be a dead exclusion. I can't imagine it will be in the operating budget. <laughs> so, so, you know, that will be subject to approval by both towns. And uh, if one town is, uh, you know, particularly under the gun financially, you may end up having a field that uh, doesn't get replaced in a timely fashion, and this, you know, safety issues and so forth. So I, I do think it's, uh, it's, it's worth, uh, you know, continuing this work. I think it's at a point now where it transitions to school committee members, uh, and I'm going to uh, bring back the community usage agreement there was a, a lot of work done by district administration, uh, including myself and superintendent, a lot of uh, interaction with different parties on it. It got to a point where then uh, I it was Kathy Snook as a school committee member who really uh, took, took it the rest of the way to something that reflected the school committee's inputs and perspectives. I think, I think you have a, you know, a, a good working draft, but I think it transitions to, to you know, well enough, I'll have to support that, but uh, I think direct conversation between school committee and FCCF and, and their liaison is very really much more important at this point in time. So what you're showing us is the draft as far as you brought it with, with FCCF. Uh, yep, yeah, with, uh, with input from FCCF, uh, the liaison in this document has been John Boynton. Um, and I'm happy to, you know, support whatever school committee member or members uh, do the work uh, for a historical and just district perspective on it, administrative perspective. But I do think it kind of moves into your realm. So I, I would be happy to do, because I worked at the front end of the community use agreement and I'm familiar with this document. And I just want to make sure it syncs up with the community use agreement because it's referenced in it. And it, um, so I guess I'm volunteering for that. That's great. Should we also have only one of you is here right now, but someone from the campus advisory yeah, I mean, committee I, involved with that? I can check with Mary, who I'm who is out of town right now, but she'll be in town Friday. So, so one I of us. Be fine. Maybe. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I would think so, but you know. But let's not presume anything, but yeah, I'll check with her. Okay. And yeah, I would I, I obviously be willing to do that. This is just my own suggestion in terms of, uh, I, I, I would think that a school committee member who's on the CCHS campus advisory committee would be a suitable, would be a suitable person, yeah. not necessarily 
Oh, that's what I meant. I meant yeah, either Bob or Mary. Yeah, I meant, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is some time here. Yes, exactly. No, that's, that's exactly what I meant. Um, so that it'll be Melissa and Bob or Mary who work with. Mm -hmm. So if we have individually have comments on this, should we send them to you two and to CC committee and so we don't get into a delivery thing? Um, it's, always, to it. it's always safe to send an email to Lori and then she can bring it back to us, right? Yeah. Yeah. John? Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking more broadly here. Um, with this work that, um, uh, that Melissa and presumably Bob um, will undertake with the agreement, um, Am I right that the timeline here is ideally we would vote on this at the next joint meeting, November 14th? I don't, I don't know that there's a, a compelling deadline, but I think I think they they want to. I, I would think they would like to wrap this up in the next couple of months. I, okay. That might be a question to ask them directly. They, there might be some the FCCF board or you know, that committee might that membership might really want to do it. That I'm, I'm not aware of. It. Okay. Okay, so maybe that's something uh, to find out. Sure. What, what's the timeline they have in mind for this? It's been kicking around for a couple of years. So. Oh, okay. okay. I think I, right. we did, um, I think there was a promise to town meetings ago to have this established, and, and I think we probably, by at least the next town meeting, we should, we should have it done. <laughs> I think that was, that, I think that was that. a community use agreement around the CP, CPC plan. No, and there was some, com there was a lot of pushback or co conversation about, you know, the cost and the then subsequent replacement cost. Um, I, I might have this wrong, but my memory is that it was stated that the, the, co the replacement cost was taken care of and it would not fall on it. This, the school district. Yeah, I don't know if it, I don't know if it was stated that it would be the entire cost or partial or whatever. And there's also there's also an expectation that the district maintain those fields mm -hmm. way uh, these groups that have contributed to mm -hmm. the development of the fields want. Right. That was one of my budget questions. Yes. 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 <laughs> so I think exactly. sooner rather than later is probably the idea. Yeah. 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 Good. Okay. All That's right. Great. Thank you for bringing it. To so us. timing again, we would presumably, if it's me, meet early next week sometime, or well, next step. In other words, what's the next step? I'm just saying there's a lot of things coming. I think you. Yeah, we're. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think this is yeah. listen contact FCCPF and see see what can be hammered out and, okay. and discussed. Yeah. And then, uh, the norm for referring to FCCF is friends. Okay, that's the norm. The friends. It's not the okay. protocol. It's the norm. Got it. <laughs> Good. Phew. All right, so uh, warrant article Warrant proposals. article proposals. All right, um, so <clears throat> some warrant articles that I would anticipate people. No, go ahead. That, that I would anticipate would, of course, be the CC operating budget. Uh, for the first time in probably eight or nine years, uh, there would be a capital warrant discussion. Possibly uh, we'll talk about the, the lighting improvements. Uh, some of the lighting around the access road from Walden to the road that goes by the high school, uh, possibly some lighting, uh, some of the curving. I don't know some of the curving. There's some uh, places there where that might, that's kind of a new uh, piece, but it's a needed piece. And those would be things that I think could be put forward uh, by the school committee without going through the whole campus advisory committee. They, they can, they're essentially safety. So they need to be addressed fairly fast. And uh, just to clarify, John, we with CPS, we pretty much have a capital request every year, and it, the town yes. manager already provides for it. With the region, we don't usually. So this is kind of an extra yes. ask. So but the, it's the difference is 
for the region, uh, any capital improvements at the region uh, need to be approved by, you need the four votes. Right. Uh, just like we need for the landfill, you need a positive vote at both town meetings, yep. and then uh, a majority vote at the polls. At the polls. Yeah. So it needs to be supported by both districts. Okay. Uh, both towns. Okay. Uh, and, it, for, and then the first step that needs to be a majority vote of the school committee to authorize right. that in the work. Don't worry. Yep. Uh, now, uh, for CPS, of course, the operating budget, uh, we got some good news from the uh, comp and finance director that the CPS capital uh, program will probably go from 800000 up to 900000 So that, that's, uh, that's great news. That's a great possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I think given uh, the situation that we've uh, talked about with special education, and I haven't had a chance to say this too far. <laughs> Good boy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you can hear a phone being well, well, uh, But I, I think we ought to consider a placeholder for a supplemental appropriation due to the special education, the summer movement cost, and some of the growth in the, um, again, growth, more growth in the concrete integrated preschool expenses. And if you think about this, for those people that have been following the budget cycles for many, many years, Back around 2006, 2007, we had supplemental appropriations that were not moved. In the past three budget cycles, past three or four budget cycles, going back to 2014, we've actually, for the first time, tried to move a supplemental appropriation, which resulted in a tie vote. We were very concerned uh, about last year's budget. Uh, so there's been a lot of pressure. So what, what it really is indicating is that uh, the, the budget increases versus the expenses and the OPEP conversation is getting challenging. So I think uh, placeholders uh, for each, possibly for the CC budget and also for the CPS budget for supplemental appropriations due to spend expenditures is, uh, um, should be considered. And then the other piece, uh, and I might get a kick in the chin again, <laughs> is, uh, so watch the way I work. Yeah, so I big heels on, you better be careful. Yeah. <laughs> a possible discussion of special education stabilization. Fund. So the Municipal Modernization yeah, Act uh, allows for a more uh, expeditious mm -hmm. development of that fund. So uh, just those are, those are the things that I see uh, as likely conversations that should take place. <laughs> Ooh. Would that would that stabilization fund accept uh, circuit breaker carryover monies, or would we keep that? So circuit breaker carryover money. Um, circuit breaker carryover. You're not going to have money. any. <laughs> We're not going to have okay. any, but in years where we yeah. do, circuit breaker carryover money must be used in the following fiscal year. Okay. But, so you wouldn't put it in. But when you use that. If other things are going well, it it uh, reduces expenditures in the operating budget, yeah. which could be uh, voted similar to the way we established the uh, CCHS and CPS technology stabilization funds. Those resulted from underruns in the operating budgets. So there there there, there is a linkage, yeah. but not direct. Not not direct. And you wouldn't want to vote direct. No, because, because we're you wouldn't money that you'd have to spend it. It's a, kind of feeds purpose of stabilization. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's something to take under consideration because spend is getting particularly volatile. It's so right. unpredictable. Yeah. yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Challenge. Okay. So basically, the, and that's it. So basically, there are five that we're looking at: uh, the regional. What did I get them all? Regional budget, regional capital expenditure, CPS budget. Supplemental appropriation placeholder and spend stabilization fund. Well, uh, four for CPS and four for oh, I totally school. missed. I so um, supplemental appropriations. We're going to bring this to you in a packaged form. We okay. just wanted to get some things on. Just the idea. Yeah, yeah, I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Operating budget. Yeah. budget. So what? This is CC and this is CPS. Yeah. Okay. Operating budget. Uh, capital warrants for both. Right. 
Uh, oh, yeah, I consideration that. supplemental appropriations and consideration of oh, for state both. stabilization. Okay. For both. We're going gotcha. to have a okay. conversation on this. Got it. Okay. Yep. I just want to make sure I have them all out there. Thank you, Any John. Any other? I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, John. Oh, I said thank you, John. Well, yeah. Yes. Um, and John, I, I have to say this idea of the uh, Special Education Stabilization Fund uh, is another example of your forethought um, yeah. over the, the time. You know, people have mentioned to me, well, this was John's idea, you know, doing something like this. And well, it, really, it really was um, great forethought. So I thank you. I, uh, I, but it's, it's, it's widely discussed statewide in the yeah. Modernization Act uh, reflected it. But, yeah. uh, we were we had talked about it prior to that act, so thank Yeah, no, but I appreciate it. Thank There's you. some nuances to look at on that because how you get the money out of the stabilization account is yeah. right now a town meeting discussion. So oh, interesting. Floss CPS. Oh, right. Yes. Right. Oh, right. Right. So there's some nuances to be sure we understand how it got works. Yeah. Um, other municipalities are trying to also be sure that the, but, and this would be the case certainly for the CPS, whatever's left you have to be sure gets to the stabilization, which we were finding in my other life that the flow from there didn't have a formal process to it in the law, and there was a lot of trust that needed to be in place. So mm -hmm. um, we, the, the premise is excellent, no question. Yeah. It's still yeah. a young law, though, so it just, yeah. maybe by the time we're there, it'll have been vetted because the other districts are already having okay, good. Yeah. All right. That's great. Good to know. All right, Any, anything else on the warrant question? All right. Uh, the request to approve transfer of CCHS class funds. So, uh, also, I believe the byproduct of the municipal modernization. Mm -hmm. um, so, there's a provision okay. in here where if uh, the class offices from a graduating class haven't used the money within a couple of years, uh, then that money can go to the general fund. So uh, uh, auditing and uh, accounting, they don't like to see money lying in the and that's, that's what this is about. And uh, the high school principal, Mike Mastrullo, has, uh, he's generated this request because he, he'd like to see a, a portion of the funds used to fund two art projects at the school. And, um, and it was projects would come from student competition and the artwork was requested by the parents of the class of 2014 and approved by the class offices of the class of 14 and so there is a, a but there was never uh, a project to use the funds for at that point in time so now they want to use those funds for this project And then also there's some much older money. Uh, it was $8,000 raised by the class of 2009. And uh, oddly enough, uh, Ray Pavlik and Brian Miller, uh, uh, assistant principal Ray Pavlik, rather uh, uh, Brian Miller and Ray the Science, that, uh, were the class of 2009 advisors and they, they would both like to see the project. And uh, they would like to consult with the campus advisory Committee, superintendent and the school committee on that project. So that's what this transfer is, is uh, based on. We've also included the school committee policy that procedurally outlines how you can form it. It outlines it pretty clearly. It's I, I mean, reading through it, I it answered all my questions. It must be that incredible policy subcommittee. <laughs> that's that right. That <laughs> <laughs> Quite, quite and clearly there's, there's good checks and balances, I think, embedded yeah. in here. So, yeah. it all makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that great. is on your agenda to vote tonight. If yes. Right. Uh -huh. Okay. Are we voting it now, or just move on? And uh, let's vote it in order. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we have the. F is there anything else on this issue? People, any questions? <coughs> okay. So, uh, the first reading of school committee policies. Laura, do you want to? Yes. So, I hope you can follow what we sent to you. Uh, let's talk through it, though, just to be sure. HB 
the, one, the first one you're looking at tonight, negotiation legal status. This one's very simple. There are no proposed changes to the current policy. <coughs> uh, MASC, the MASC version was reviewed and it's all the same, so there's no changes. Okay. HF, School Committee Negotiating Agents. So what I sent to you um, as follow-up yesterday was sort of a one-page summar summary of what the changes were. So, uh, the, and this predates me, so Bob, if you were there and can remember, um, the current policy was matched against the MASC policy and um, minor tweaks were made. So a sentence was added to the second paragraph. Um, a bulleted item was deleted underneath the good faith bargaining units, everything else is the same as what you had before and aligned with the MSC version. Mm -hmm. Tutoring for pay, this one's probably the most interesting of the bunch. Um, you, you got copies from us about the current policy, the MASC policy, the subcommittee, I don't know how many times this conversation happened, at least twice, if not three times at the subcommittee level. So we, uh, Luke Kelly, Boston in and charged her with a solution to a very complex discussion. Um, so her idea, which we're bringing to you tonight, was not to try to reinvent law and regulation that's already very clearly outlined. So the conflict of interest law very clearly outlines procedural pieces about tutoring. So we've included those for you. Um, the public school FAQ on the conflict of interest law, which really hit more than the committee would have thought of. So that became the reference point, and then that would mean that the policy simply refers to this document as, as the practice. Um, we're open to your feedback on that, but, and the, sub, the subcommittee went around several times on, on this. There's just so many variables to try to address. The basic premise is pretty straightforward. You can't use school resources for private tutoring. Right. But there's so many nuances. I think the subcommittee felt wanted to be outlined to help inform the discussion, uh, especially when a teacher has a question that there's some document to go to that this, this document did that. So that's the tutoring one. Um, so you broke, in that case, you broke from both your previous one and the NASC policy. I'm reading through it, I, my first take, having not gone through it in detail before, was that it seemed like a, it seemed to address everything and pretty clearly. I felt like it took some complicated stuff and synced it up pretty well. So, so uh, I'm looking at the Mass General Law now. Yeah. In sum, a teacher who is approached by parents of a student in his district but who is not one of his own students, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, may do so. So in theory, the way this is written, um, if, if I'm in the science department at the high school, a colleague of mine can tutor one of my own students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there some piece of an expectation that the student will become a student of the person doing the tutor? Say that again. Isn't there something about uh, if there is an expectation that the student for oh, whom will the be. tutoring would be done would become a student of the tutor in a subsequent mm -hmm. year, yeah. it does. That, then yeah. that's no longer right. Yeah. If that's predictable. Did, right. It did say that. It, and my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, and Melissa, because by training you're into this oh. law stuff. Um, that nothing, nothing prevents us from going beyond the minimum that the law requires. Okay. How often do we have faculty tutoring for the next current students? I can't speak to this okay. high school yet, but I know in every other high school I've interacted with, and in my own kids at ten, it's pretty frequent. But it's not supposed to. Well, it depends. Again, it's all within the laws of the of the ethics. Right. So they can't tutor their own kids. They can't do it at the school building. So it is a common practice across high schools in Massachusetts. There's no question about that. Within the bounds of the ethics law. Mm -hmm. 
Does the do the schools keep a, a call list for tutors? Usually not, no. no. Okay. Because I, I, I'm not sure how I feel about a teacher in the same building and that a student is in tutoring a student in the building even though they're not, or mm -hmm. literally in the building, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, when they're not their own student because that could potentially lead to conflict of interest. I, I don't know. It, it, it opens up a can of worms I'm not sure we want to get into. No, that's What's been the practice? That's been the practice up until, I mean, that I is the practice so. now? I, I, don't, I, could, I don't have any data to go with that. Okay. Um, and then there's a contract issue too, right? We're, we we solved for that. There's some issue about getting, um, I guess this is the parent initiating it, not the school initiating it. Okay, so there's a distinction. Yeah. So I think that's, that's some of what you're gonna have to wrestle with is if you wanna be very clear about your expectations. Here um, or it's something in this realm that is bothering me in the past. Um, I know that there's been a sort of a college prep tutoring session done uh, in the school. Um, yes. By by somebody from the guidance department, mm -hmm. which seems to me to be a conflict. I don't think. Um, because that's, you know, you know, I mean, now you've got kids who are paid to go to this class who are part of the body politic the next year going through the guidance department. And I just, it's, it seems adult problematic ed? to me. Is it, is it in adult ed? Is it offered through adult ed? I think it's off campus. It's off campus. It's in concert, but off campus. What about I'll be honest, this could turn into quite a can of worms yeah. because we've got camps being run on the fields in the summer for the teams by the coaches who aren't on our clock. Mm -hmm. And that's some of what we got up against, that to try to put parameters on it. And there's just a long list. It doesn't mean we shouldn't. Right. I think this is why the, the subcommittee kept circling. Yeah, I mean, so. yeah. You know, is it okay along those lines? Is it okay for an English teacher currently at the high school and a math teacher currently at the high school to, to band together, advertise SAT prep sessions off campus? It happens off mm -hmm. campus. You don't use any materials right. from the school, not, not, right. but you've got a captive audience and they're in your class, mm -hmm. but it's not your class material, it's not math, it's SAT. Um, There's a lot of scenarios. Oh. Yeah. I think to be, I feel like here is one of these situations where I'm going to step up and say I don't feel educated enough to really debate it right now. I think in order to have more of a discussion about it, I need to understand more of what our practice has been up until now. Would it make sense for the policy subcommittee to put a, a memo to get together for us? Highlighting, outlining the things that can come up in the discussion process that we then talk about here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Along with some understanding of current practice. That would be helpful. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of all scenarios. Okay. It's not past 9:30, so I won't go through them. But. Yeah. 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 So okay. I guess. So let's discuss this. When this, this conversation one more. happened at the subcommittee level a, couple, a few weeks ago. Yeah. And why this became the deciding part, because this places the responsibility on a teacher. Rather, yeah. that was the thinking behind it, just right. so you can take that with you as you're processing. Got it. This became a teacher responsibility to abide by the law. Okay. Versus a school district trying to patrol trying all to these enforce things. Mm -hmm. We then had the ability to be reactive and say, this is, the, this right. is what you're living with. This is what. Anyway, yeah. I, I I'm I not sure if it answers that. it or not, Makes given sense. all the other conversations. But that was, that was mm -hmm. the thoughtful thinking. Yeah. Um, this last one, I'm giving you hot off the press, so it needs to go back to the subcommittee, but I thought we'd try to be efficient since you're here. So this is the student publications policy. This was brought, it's come up out of order because a parent brought it up as a, a concern. Right. So we, the 
the subcommittee looked at the MASC version, looked at the current version, and tried to be reflective of what this uh, family was concerned about. So much of that was about adding the word school sponsor, because much of that particular episode was around a child's publication that was done on their own time. Individually, right. And not a school sponsored product, meaning school signed, school related. Right. Um, so the committee, subcommittees put in school sponsored. The piece I just handed out to you, we then, I shared it with Peter to get his feedback given all the civil rights pieces that are embedded here and some of the very clear laws of freedom of press and all of that. So you've got what he sent me today. Um, and honestly, it took him a while on this one. I think we had him a little going cautiously on, on making sure he got it perfect, so. Yeah. Um, he has edited a bit what the subcommittee came up with. Um, our main points were, I think, reflective. I did talk, I had converse, have email dialogue with his father. Um, it sounded to me like the main concern was making sure that uh, we were not editing a child's publication that happened off of a school, beyond a school act, you know, related right. activity. Mm -hmm. Um, we wanted to be sure we preserved our options to inter interact with kids on school-related publications. Obviously, those are learning materials. Right. Uh, and then the piece that I was most concerned on, the distribution of literature is under the purview of the principal, um, when and how that's going to happen, um, at least on school time. And that was the crux of this, I mean, it's if I remember correctly, that was being distributed It was at the school. distribution, school. yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, and then I'm curious, I remember as part of this discussion when the parent came, that at least one of the, the main points that was brought back to him was the fact that the school in this case is the publisher and therefore has a right, if, in a school, or at least in a school-sponsored student publication, the school or district is the publisher and just like an editor of a magazine has a right to decide what gets published and what doesn't. And there was a paragraph like that in this, in one of these drafts, maybe it was the other one that you emailed to us, and it's now been taken out. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious why we took that out. Well, so the, the discussion looked between the two. So the MASC policy is mostly what you have, and then, which did not include that paragraph. Okay. The current so that was MASC something that we policy. had created? Okay. It was just dated, I, I think, and hadn't been updated, and MASC didn't see the need okay. to have it. Okay. We did keep one strong sentence from the current document about libel and unfounded charges, mm -hmm. and right. that carried over from the previous document, but the rest of it is the MASC version until Peter looked at it. So right, okay, and Dr. Um. Okay, I don't know. I only think in last year when this came up, having written there that district is the publisher and has a right to decide what it publishes was helpful to have there in the policy. <coughs> now maybe this just <coughs> covers it without specifying that because it was under distribution of literature. But well we read it. That's the feedback we need. Okay. So that, that's feedback. It was helpful at least to have it there before mm -hmm. unless for some reason it, we don't want it. Which I don't know. I think the other one is maybe just not as stated as specifically. Right. So. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, this is more discussion than we've had over policy in a while. <laughs> you're you're just now getting into the uh, student related ones. This uh, is where all this is where the is. discussion. Yeah. Is. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Now we get me. <laughs> You've been at the real high procedural level. Right. So yeah. Easy stuff. Yeah. Got it. Um, okay. Good. So this is our first reading on the. This will come back to us next time, and it may be edited by that point, or it will come back uh, at, I like think this. I'm gonna show the, I'm trying to be a little bit efficient here, because otherwise we can just get caught in these loops between the two committees, so. The student publications one, I will share with them on Friday when we meet what Peter, what Peter suggested. I think barring anything based on his feedback, okay. if you wanna send any other feedback to them to talk about, but really it is your policy, so I, we can see how substantial the changes are. I yeah. think it would be up for a vote. Okay. Substantially.
I think that's your purview. You know, the policy subcommittee should recommend and then you debate and, and discuss. We debate it. Okay. If it's really substantial that we got to restart the process, like right. maybe the tutoring one, yeah. that's got to go back to the subcommittee. Yeah. Um, so I will need your direction on the tutoring one, where what to do with that if we're at the point where the subcommittee really needs to go back and yeah. see what the options are. I think, I think Wally's suggestion of having kind of the, the points debated in front of us yeah. would be helpful. Because I feel like it's so broad right now that I'm not, Dan's coming up with lots of scenarios, but I'm I know, not we'll as much in that area. as we can. Right, yeah. be something we don't include. Yeah. Okay. All right, are we then on to action, action items? items. <clears throat> okay, so, so Heather, why first, you take a, yep, it's first CPS. one is um, a CPS one. I would be looking for a motion that the Concord School Committee vote to accept the $1,000 donation from Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories. So moved. Second. Any discussion on this, or is there any? Background we should know? I'm afraid I don't know how much to do. Is this an end? I'm sorry, I should. It's wonderful. It's I wonderful. I would yeah, say. Wonderful. Thank you to the Schweitzer Engineering Labs. Yes. It's not ringing a bell. I'm, I'm sorry, we don't have that. Right? We well, Nathan. I don't know. I'll add, with thanks, we're very grateful that it's coming. Any other discussion? I don't recognize it. I don't recognize it. I don't recognize it. <laughs> Great. Well, any other discussion about it? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Or abstentions? Okay, that one right. passes. Next. So, vote to approve transfer of class funds. Can I have a motion to approve the transfer of class funds as outlined by Principal Mike Mistrula? So moved. Move second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay. Thank you. And we have policies to approve. So I would move that the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committees vote to approve the attached school committee policies. GCIA, GCJ, GCO, GDO, GDQC, and GDQD. Okay. For both? For both. I was expecting this. <laughs> Practice. Yeah. <laughs> right. <Get more. laughs> Any discussion from either committee on those? We talked about these last time. Mm -hmm. All in favor for Conquer? Aye. 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 Any abstain or oppose? Go ahead. You have to read it for the oh, uh, for the same policies? <laughs> right. All right. Can I? Uh, you have a motion. You have a motion. motion. I have a motion. <laughs> I'm turning into a pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> um, so any, so we have a motion on the table. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? <laughs> Abstain? Thank you. All right. So I move that the Concord Carlisle School Committee vote to approve the CCHS China cultural trip with the condition that we receive a signed district liability insurance waiver from all participants. Second. Discussion? It looks fabulous. Yeah, I'll ask another great same, trip. I know. Um, the same question that comes up often, which is our students, I'm assuming there's a way that students can apply for some financial aid to be a part of this trip if they can I mean there's a bigger conversation to be had there because we could never financially support extensive numbers of right. kids so I, there's a bigger conversation there okay but certainly at the individual level given what we would there's expect for our need right now yes. okay pardon me if i've asked this before in a previous meeting is there a formal mechanism in place for a student to pursue a scholarship or a trip? I don't think there's a formal mm -hmm. one. No, I think that would be part of the bigger discussion. Yeah. How yeah. that would happen. Okay. Okay. So we have a motion and a second? We do. Any further discussion? That's All right. It. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed?
Opposed? Abstain? All right. Thank you. We're done with uh, action items. Done with action items. Old business. Just Old business. Uh, down to 18. Uh, just, just very briefly, um, also with the old business the transportation, there was an open house this past week. And it, was, it was fairly well attended. A lot of people came by. They were very impressed with the really great facility. And there was also a lot of interest in the. We need to pass all the I have them all. I was going to quietly do that while I said <laughs> that, but that's okay. Take, take over the chair. Um, we, we don't have, we're not a single. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are those different from what we're on the agenda? No. So I'll start with CPS, and uh, as you know, uh, we've talked about $550,000 to $650,000 in new special education costs coming in over the summer, and also some additional growth in the confidence of the preschool. So that's why you see a, uh, a year to date balance. And this is before application of certain grade receipts, by the way. So, uh, but right now, that's money uh, in the red. Uh, but we do have certain grade money coming in. And um, you will also note that there's a $200,000 encumbrance shown in the regular instruction line. That is really a placeholder for the media step that will occur. Okay. So uh, relative to where we were last year, uh, we, we do have some, uh, you know, recall last year we also had a lot of budgetary pressure with a lot of the same items and some other items. So uh, we're doing okay compared to last year handling so far, but we need to be very careful going forward. And uh, we know that uh, you know, there will be, all of this translates into a situation where you're going to use up uh, you know, a much higher percentage of your circuit breaker money this year. So the strength of the circuit breaker carryover will, will be diminished or possibly eliminated, and that will in turn put pressure on the 19 budget. So it's going to, and the other piece of that too is the state has already indicated that 13.5% uh, reduction. Uh, in certain frequencies this year. So, a couple of things for us. How much reduction? Well, it's going from 70, uh, the, the legally stated goal is 75%. They're talking about 65%, but that oh. really translates into a 13.5% reduction in the amount of money people expect. Bears hmm. watching. Mm -hmm. uh, so, there's you know, you'll see some things in, in the development cycle for the 18 budget that are related to that. Uh, for the region, uh, also in special education, and also before application of certain program receipts. You'll, you'll, I'm sure all of your eyes jump to that million one hundred and fifty six negative number. We have special education certain program receipts that will help us address that number. Uh, we have some new hits there as well. Uh, but that will be a challenge, and it will pressure E and D in the FY18 closing process. We, you can actually see pressure uh, in the FY17 closing process because you see that the uh, in the lower left-hand corner there, we see 26,608 as the FY17 adopted budget, but the expenditures are roughly $200,000 higher than that, and that really represents what will be a decline in. That is money that's not going back into the EMD because we have used up all of the circuit breaker receipts for the past three years and there's no circuit breaker down So the high school budget is, is being challenged as well. But uh, we, we're working on that and uh, because of that decrease in the EMD, you'll see uh, when we talk about the budget development process and the assessments worksheet where we show the contribution, you'll see a, a fairly marked reduction in, in the amount of in-district um, contributions towards lowering the assessments because our uh, EMD is, uh, is falling fairly, fairly fast. We've talked about it for the past couple of years, mainly driven by uh, the OPEC. You know, the displacement of those money is really available. The current year operating expenses. Well, that's
That's it. Bless you. Thank you. So um, we're doing okay, but it's, it's, it's tight, it's, it's challenging, and we're being very careful. Plan at the next meeting is to bring you some of the overages and underages, uh, so you can see some of the other flow. We'd like you to tran officially vote some transfers. I think we still have a little discussion on at what level, because obviously the SPED one, you would probably want to vote that. Um, but right. if there's, an, there's some other places I'd like to be pretty transparent about, because they're not necessarily things in our control. Um, or just tracking of how, of how we're putting money to paper. Um, probably one of the great examples is the Spanish materials that we've purchased. We put that in a separate line so we can track what we spent on the program, which therefore means that whole line is in the red. Right. But it's coming from another place. So some of those moving pieces, I think the more we help you all see some of that, um, what level you actually vote and approve will shake up on before the meeting. But right. and I would just add to that. Teachers. I can't hear you. The foreign language teachers, when we were developing the 18 budget in 60, uh, we didn't have foreign language elementary teacher lines in each, yeah. each of the schools. Right. Yeah. So it just went into the uh, K 5 teaching lines. Okay. So we need to move those pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm Makes sorry. Sense. If you said, I'm sorry. But <coughs> the special ed um, is. Uh, like enrollment. Yeah, we get a little bit of enrollment. Uh, we, we, get, we had some significant enrollment increases in CPS, but we also, it's not necessarily the numbers off at the high school, it's often the nature of the placements they can change. Okay. And so we have pressures at the high school as well. Thank you. Um, before we call for uh, motions for adjournment, I just want to say I'm really glad we made this happen. Um, Lori, thank you for all the logistics. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Um, thank I you to huge Aaron Jonkis. Uh, yeah, Aaron Jonkis did I'm a great a, job a, a with outreach and getting a crowd here. And, um, yeah. Well, arranging the site, I mean, everything. Yeah, yeah all, the logistics. all the logistics. On yeah. The side, so. um, yes. And I just want to thank everybody for making the trek out here. Um, I think it's important we were here tonight. And to those of you who are all the yeah. way here to the end, too. Thank and they're shutting the lights on us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. It was yes. wonderful. Yeah. And wonderful to hear from the students. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank Do we you. have a motion to adjourn? So no. moved for both. Is there a second? Second. For both. For both. All, right. all in favor for CPS? Aye. 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 So all, those did, in, oh, sorry. all those in favor of the region? Aye. Aye. Aye.